for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue. The Department of Basic Education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 Basic Education Sector Lakota a success. Thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue. of basic education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 basic education sector Lakota a success thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue
The Department of Basic Education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 basic education sector Lekhota a success. Thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue. The Department of Basic Education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 basic education sector Lekhota a success. Thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue.
of Basic Education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 Basic Education Sector Lakota a success. Thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue. The Department of Basic Education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 Basic Education Sector Lakota a success. Thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue. of Basic Education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 Basic Education Sector Lakota a success. Thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand 
and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue. The Department of Basic Education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 Basic Education Sector Lekhota a success. Thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue. of basic education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 basic education sector Lekhota a success thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue
The Department of Basic Education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 Basic Education Sector Lakota a success. Thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue. of basic education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 basic education sector Lakota a success thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue The Department of Basic Education wishes to thank all of its partners and sponsors for playing a role in making the 2024 Basic Education Sector Lakota a success. 
thank you to all of you for playing a role and for raising your hand and indeed carrying the adage that education is a societal issue. Uh, can we get uh, colleagues who are still outside uh, to come inside and get settled? Uh, let me greet the minister, uh, the deputy minister, the honorable MECs who are in the house, uh, the members of the portfolio committee, uh, all the stakeholders uh, in the meeting. Uh, firstly, we want to apologize for starting five minutes late. We we're supposed to start at eight and uh, we will go straight to our program. Uh, the program of the day is shorter than the other two days, but uh, the discussions and the deliberations are very important, especially because uh, we will conclude with the reports from the com commissions. Uh, the first session, uh, we are going to have is a panel discussion, but let me hasten to say that uh, I'm standing here for the HOD in Pumalanga, uh, Mayor Moyane, who is not available today. And uh, our first session will be a panel discussion, which will be under the leadership of Prof Professor Cronier. May I request Prof and the panel to come forward, uh, as I call them, with Professor Cronier uh, from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, Prof. Yunis Vala. We have uh, Don Peterson. Uh, we have uh, Alex Trinda Smith. Those are the members of the panel. And uh, we will take a discussion here uh, as facilitated by the panel. May the pen panel members all come to the podium. And the sub theme here is leveraging digital transformation to equip learners with skills for the changing world. Are we all here? Yes, all the panel members are here, and uh, we will then uh, hand over to the facilitator, Professor Cronier. Thank you, Program Director. Good morning, ladies, gentlemen. I must say it's amazing. There, there are really sharp lights in here. So if my eyes start blinking, it's because there are really sharp lights in here. This is very exciting for me to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you very much for your kind introduction. And so we are here to discuss digital standards, which we're also changing to digital guidelines, um, because they, that seems, seems a little less... Thank you, that's very kind of you. They're turning the lights on, how very nice of them. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start by asking Dr. Isabel Tarling, who's done a spectacular job over the past couple of months to put together the, a, a digital standards portfolio for us. And this is all in recognition of uh, the 2004, can you believe it goes that far back, 2004 Green Paper on e-education that we're now beginning to give life to. So this is a very exciting project, and I'm going to ask Dr. Tarling to share it with you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and good, uh, good morning. Good morning. It's still morning. Hey, somewhere in the world it's afternoon. Um, <laughs> let's see. Can we have the slides on, please? There we go. So... What we did was we worked in the last year to develop digital guidelines for South Africa's basic education sector. And what we wanted to do was to create something that's very much homegrown, something that's developed from teachers, from NGOs, school principals, 
um, the whole spectrum of everybody who's part of uh, the digital landscape in South Africa. And one of our big issues, and, and it was so wonderful to hear Minister Mochecha talk about it, is to say we really are a village. So as a village, we take com combined responsibility for what we're doing. So we started off by thinking and imagining the village that we're going to be teaching in. And for us, it was really important to make sure that we look at all sorts of contexts, not just contexts where there are already digital learning strategies available, but very much contexts where it's not available at the moment. So looking at everybody on the spectrum and seeing how we can help them. So if you want to, you can grab your phone, you can uh, scan the QR codes, and you can see the guidelines that we have already available. If you're looking, at, if your phone isn't wanting to scan, you can also use uh, the QR code, uh, the, the tiny URL. Uh, so you type in tinyurl.com on your phone, and uh, then you can go and type in tinyurl forward slash capital D, capital G, so digital guide. Uh, 24. And then you can actually have the guidelines, that the document on your phone. What you'll see is that the, the document was very much developed to reflect the realities of South African education. It was developed by about 100 volunteers in a very iterative cycle. So we came together here at the Birchwood twice. We worked online, uh, there was about, oh, I don't know, more than 20 meetings that we had online where we would sit and work with people, uh, principals and teachers from the Eastern Cape, um, NGOs from Pumalanga and uh, from uh, principals um, like Dawn Peterson here, um, from the Western Cape, all over South Africa, people were part of this process. And it was very much supported by the British Council and the FCDO who, who supported it financially and with um, uh, logistical support, etc. So we couldn't have done this process if we didn't have a whole team working together. And what the team did was, we started off, um, they, they set me reading. They had me go and read a whole lot of uh, texts. And uh, so I did a literature review as an input document. And from the literature review, developed this theory of digital capital. And we spoke around, the theory is very much grounded in uh, social um, understanding so, and sociology to understand how technology works. And we, we spoke about, in the world, we need to know people. Our networks tell us who we know, and it helps you um, so much. If you need to find someone to help you with something, you just reach out and they help you. That's your social network. Your cultural capital, and we call that social capital. Your cultural capital is what you know, your knowledge, your experience, that's your cultural capital. And then we obviously we have economic capital. There's other sorts of capitals as well. But we spoke around when you want to use a device, you need all three of these. You need social capital. If you want to be online, you need to know how to engage online. You need to know this is the etiquette for when I engage online. This is what people do when they are trolls and they are bullying you. Um, so you've got that social capital. And you know all the influencers? They're the ones who are coining the social capital um, in all sorts of wonderful ways. Then you need the cultural capital. You need to know how to behave online. You need to know how to use devices. What you know in your head, what you know in your fingers. That's your cultural capital. So we spoke around this theory of digital capital to use it as a tool to say you need all these capitals to develop if you're going to be a flourishing, competent, excellent um, person working in the 21st century. So you'll see, what we then went and did was we took the, the uh, digital capital map, there's six areas to it, and you'll see at the bottom, it's the foundation, is your, your digital competencies, your skills, your digital com uh, skills and your digital literacies. And the skills flow right through, because we're a whole human being, we've got skills in all sorts of places, and that's why it's a circle. And then at the top, you'll see these are uh, digital uh, citizenship. I think I've got the old map. Oh my gosh, that is the old map. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, I'll fix it for you. It's still the same thing. 
but then what we did was we looked at six groups of, of um, educators in our schools, and we said we've got oh, six groups of stakeholders, which we eventually went down and we said we've got, we're going to look at four. And we started off by looking at institutions. And we said, if you're a school or an institution, you need to have guidelines as to what to do to develop your institution, to develop the people in it, and also to develop the people around it that support it. So you'll see we've got with our institution, we said, we start off with the digital guidelines to develop our digital journey. And every school is at a different place. Every school has a unique digital journey. That means what's happening in their school cannot be replicated in another space. It could be more or less the same and we can learn from each other, but every school needs to develop their own digital journey. And to do that, to develop the digital capital in the school, we want to look at identifying the digital competencies and literacies that's already available, and how do you build on that? What is already in your school? If you don't have electricity, you don't have power, you don't have um, digital, you, there's someone who's going to know something about something digitally. But if you're at an advanced level or a medium level, everybody's digital journey will be different. Also, the school will look at something like appointing different staff members. So when you have new appointments or when you're developing your, your existing staff, when you do the TP, uh, teacher professional development for digital learning, you're going to do it in different ways at different schools. And it's not always going to look the same. We also want to look in schools and say, with these guidelines, what, do you have a digital learning succession journey? So that if someone leaves, the champion leaves the school, what's going to happen? Are they just going to, the, the whole digital learning journey falls flat? We need to build in sustainable succession. Um, and, that, and this whole picture tells us, how do we develop digital capital in the institution? Then we looked at, um, the digital skills that we want to develop. So this is just a very much an overview, but we looked at the skills to use devices. We looked at the digital literacies as well, which is coming up now now, for different groups. So for learners, for teachers, for leaders, for parents and communities, we very much saw this as a village. So it was never a case of it's the digital standards or digital guidelines are just for schools. It's always for the whole community that creates a space for digital learning to take place. We also looked at mentorships, we looked at support, and we looked at skills to lead digital learning and skills development. When it came to our digital literacies, let's see if I can move forward, there we go, we, we just looked at these many, many digital literacies, but for us we looked at, um, in a school, how do we teach our learners to have information literacies, to find information, evaluate it and use it? How do we teach our learners to find data literacies, how to understand data literacies? But it's not just the learner, how do we teach the teacher about it? And how in the school setup do you then create a space where your parents come on board and they understand data and data literacies and they understand how to use it and the school leadership, how can they use data to make really important decisions about what's happening. Then we looked at um, digital pedagogies. We looked very specifically at what the teachers, the principals, Everybody who's using digital learning, how do we bring that to a space where we constantly have conversations about digital pedagogies, where we talk about this is the evidence that proves that this works? Because too often we go for hypes and fads and we go, oh, this is fantastic, it works, because so-and-so on TikTok or Twitter said it. We want to make sure that we have evidence base to support why we want certain digital pedagogies in schools. And then also, we want to look and, and when it comes to digital capital, to develop in the whole ecosystem this thinking around critical engagement, where we don't just take something that comes to us and say, brilliant, it's fantastic, let's use it, but we ask the really important questions around what makes it useful? Why do you say it's, it's educationally sound? For like AI, why is it supposed to be so fantastic? Why is it going to help my learners? And how? Then we looked at, as part of the digital capital um, map, we looked at digital safety, and we created guidelines for learners, parents, and communities 
teachers and, and school leaders around digital safety. And the themes that came out of there was very much around how to protect data, how to protect your privacy um, of your information online for all those groups and to, def to make sure that everybody in the ecosystem has a grip on what is data privacy. What is data um, security? We looked at device safety. Like we heard one of the, the presenters was saying how the tablets were saved in the police station. How do we keep the, our devices safe? How do we teach responsible and safe use of devices? We also looked at our digital um, footprint and creating guidelines around how teachers, learners, parents, and leaders can curate the digital footprint. And we looked at how to stay on uh, aware of the next danger that is coming along. So these are just the themes that came out of the digital guidelines. When it came to digital engagement, you'll see we looked at a values-based approach. And it was so wonderful to hear everybody's contributions to what we were talking about this week beautifully coming together in this document. Remember yesterday morning, the first speaker spoke around a values-based approach. And for us with the digital guidelines, we very much wanted to have a values-based approach to what we do online, how we engage online. The person you are in face-to-face in -face conversations must be the same person that you are in online conversations. We looked at negative online behavior and how do you engage with people who are be, um, being a bully, who are spreading gossip and, and that kind of behaviors. What is the, the protocol? We looked at a first aid kit for when you have been bullied, when your child has been bullied, what do you do? How can you prevent it? And when do you go and report it? Um, when we looked at collaborating online. How do I behave in an online space? If I'm a teacher, there isn't something like my private and, and public conversations on um, any sort of social media. It, it's always me. How do I represent myself in an online space? If I'm a principal, what do I do? And then also we looked at legal requirements, the law and order. What are the guidelines around the Poppy Act? What are the guidelines about other legal requirements and statutes that we need to um, employ? This, the fifth area was on digital wellness that we brought in because being an, a digital citizen we need to develop the skills to be a, a well um, to develop digital well-being and there we were looking at positive online engagement positive behavior where you actually go and limit and manage your own time online and i know it's flipping difficult uh, we looked at how to avoid digital risks. So we know we've heard many conversations around AI and how discrimination is, is just so much easier when we've got algorithms that teach us how to discriminate against other people. And that was one of the things is, is when it comes to wellness, how do I identify these dangers and how do I avoid them? How do I make healthy digital choices for all our user groups? And then also, how do I look at the organization, if I'm the leader, to, to support and develop uh, organizational wellness when it comes to digital behavior? And lastly, I, I'm sure you heard some of our speakers were talking about agency and about efficacy. And you, there was the one speaker who specifically said, um, I don't have or I can't access or I can't do. And we wanted to, with digital agency as part of this, is develop the idea that um, whatever access I have, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it in my space. If I only have cell phones or tablets from grannies and grandpas and uncles and aunts, then we have an, a digital day and we use it. Um, I was in a school where the grade one teachers started this, I can and I will. And it's, it was incredible, the, the work that they did. They had no digital access. And the little grade ones, I remember so clearly, this little grade one was teaching the teacher how to use Bluetooth and how to to send information between different devices just using Bluetooth. So there, there's definitely ways that we can do this. And developing the digital capital of our whole ecosystem, developing the institution's digital capital, developing the, the community's digital capital, the teachers and the learners, it's creating a space where we can create digital learning journeys that are unique for each school and every person who's going to be working in that. And I have to just finish with the slide where I, 
I have to remind you that this was created by more than 100 volunteers working online, working in the evenings, spending their time. And we, we really have to thank them because this digital guideline could not have been possible without their immense support and, and um, input into the document. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tolling. And yes, it, it was a fascinating journey to go with. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to make this a little bit interactive to start off with, and so I have a task for all of you there, whoops, all of you out there, and also all of you back here. And before we go on, I'd like to acknowledge the interpreter. Thank you very much. Um, it's really nice to know that we are making an inclusive world. Um, so thank you, ma'am, uh, for being here. Um, so. I want you to take a stand and to make a, a choice of four things. I'm going to give you four items which, to my mind, combine to be the goal of education, of that which we do. But then I'd like you to rank them as from where you are sitting, which is the most important, from most important to least important, from where you are sitting. And the first one Dr. Tarling already mentioned, which is values. Values as in for the good of things. We want to make our learners better people. So that's the one we've got. The next one is money. Our students, our learners must be able to leave school and get a job and make money. If not, then what are we teaching them? So that's the second one. So the first one is values. The second one is money. The third one, and I'm not mentioning them in any particular order, I want you to put them in order. The third one is knowledge. After all, why, don't we, why do we go to school? To get some knowledge. But where in your field, at, at your desk, where does the acquisition of knowledge fit? And then the last one is actually empowerment. In other words, the learner leaves that school being able to stand on their own two feet. So I'll give you those four again, and I'm going to ask these uh, presenters, at least the panelists, when they do their bit, to tell us which their top one is, because that will give us an indication of where they come from. And it will also help you in your own decision-making and interpreting of what you're doing. So I'll give them to you again. The first one is values, cultural uh, human values. In other words, virtuousness, goodness. The second one is money, economic empowerment, if you like. The third one is knowledge. And the last one is general empowerment, being able to stand on your own two feet. Right, so now I'm going to ask the audience quickly to, vo to vote for me. Just put up your hand if values is at the top of your list. Good. This is going to be well distributed. Thank you. So I can see about one or two at every table. The next one, put up your hand if being able to make money is at the top of your list. You can see we're teachers here. We teach for the love of it. We do not teach for money. It's one of those things. Who of you put knowledge at the top? Right, you see how nicely this knowledge economy, you can see how nicely this is balanced. And who of you put empowerment, being able to stand on your own two feet? There at the back. Okay, so we seem to be really good at values and knowledge, but we don't care much for, ma for money and power, which is because we're teachers, I guess. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, that was just to start this thing. I also just want to give you another context, because schools have this strange way of sort of being very, very conservative. Now, in the past few years, we always believed that human beings were at the top of the tree. We were in charge. But then in November 2019, culminating in March 2020, nature said, no, 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 no. You human beings thought you were in charge, you're not. I'm giving you one commandment only, and that is stay away from each other at least one and a half meters and wear a mask, or I will kill just enough of you to scare the daylights out of all of you. And then what happened? The entire world bowed down to nature and said, we will obey nature. The president came on television and said, ladies and gentlemen, stop everything you're doing and obey nature. 
which was very strange. And then we thought, hey, but we're humans. We can take charge back, and we'll do that using the machines. And we took the machines, and we started communicating with Zoom, and we communicated with Teams, and some of us still remember other platforms. What was it called? Well, we communicated with WhatsApp. We communicated with machines. And you know what happened then? The machine said, hey, humans, we're going to take charge now. We're going to be in charge, the machines are, and we're going to split you into the maskers and the anti-maskers, the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers, the trumpets, the anti-trumpists, because we, the machines, want to, combat, to get the one thing that is still out there, and that is attention. And so in that way, we've now got a constant game of rock, paper, scissors, with nature wanting to be in charge, humans wanting to be in charge, and machines wanting to be in charge, and those have all fused. And so at the moment, when I speak to you right now, as I'm speaking, do you know that I am both human and machine at exactly the same time? Because just look around you. There I am, there I am, there I am, there I am. I have replicated myself four times in one room and I bet you I'm being recorded, so I'm also going to be there tomorrow and the day after and the day after. Now you may think it's funny, but I think it's scary. Because when I walk into a school, I go back 200 years and kids are sitting in rows and teachers are standing in front and it's the teacher's job to talk and the learner's job to listen and they put up their hands if they finish before you. And that's what the digital standards are about. The digital standards are about how do we recognize the fact that there's so much going on between us and between the machines and between nature and all that connection. And how do we bring that into our hearts so that we can achieve the value, the money, the knowledge, and the empowerment at the same time? So that is my introduction with which I'm now going to ask the panelists um, and I'm going to allow them, I'm going to put the question out there, and I'm not going to tell you, and if anybody says I told you, I will tell you that that is a lie, that last night the panelists WhatsApped me the questions that they want me to ask them, and so now I'm going to ask them, and you will think that it's all pure surprise to the panelists, and that they just are that clever, okay? That's the plan. So don't let them know that that's the plan. Um, but the plan is that. So the first question that I'm going to ask the pa panel at random um, is, where are the low-hanging fruits? If we've got to put a digital underpinning to what we are doing, where should we be looking to start? And then I'm going to ask volunteers from the panel, and if not, I'm going to um, appoint a volunteer. Um, and the volunteer will first tell me what their top priorities, value, money, knowledge, or uh, empowerment, and then will tell us where they think the low-hanging fruit is. Volunteers? Thank you, Professor. I will volunteer. <laughs> the game is up, clearly. Um, so we already have existing organizations who are, whose job it is to implement ICT in, uh, in education and in schools. And uh, there is a lot of information being collected by these various organizations. So I, I can speak on, on, well, I don't want to say on behalf of organizations, but I come from Siavula, an organization providing uh, support in ed tech. And um, so there is already a lot of information being collected. We are in a position to be able to assist the government and the DBE in providing that information to them to give them a snapshot of what is going on in schools at the moment. Right. That is one of the most fantastic things about uh, information and ICT is that the information is being produced immediately and can be recorded immediately and then can be assessed immediately. Um, so we've got, we've got an opportunity there where this information is being collected and, and is ready for uh, assessment by the various uh, relevant bodies. Right. And we can, we can provide that information to the DBE and give them a snapshot of what is happening in schools with regards to education. Um, but what we need is an opportunity to provide that into a central warehouse, for, for example, SA SAMS, um, and, and give the DBE the opportunity to 
collate the data, to aggregate the data, to, to really make data-driven decisions. Um, we, we also are already existing, uh, um, implementing our uh, platform across, across the country. So there are many, many organizations that are implementing um, their, their platforms across the country. And it's not just in schools that can afford it. There are, at least on our platform, there are 50% of our users who come from Quintel 1 to 3 schools. So we, we have an opportunity to provide a snapshot of not just the schools, which we think are more resourced, but also the under-resourced schools. Um, and we, we know also that uh, the, there, is, there are existing pub, public-private partnerships um, and that we can provide this support to the government uh, in collaboration with all sorts of other organizations. So it's not just the edtech organizations that need to work at this, it's the telcos to provide network yes. coverage and zero ratings, which are a vital part yes. of what we do. Um, and there are other organizations as well working towards this. We don't exist in a vacuum. The ecosystem is varied and needs support from many, many sides. So we need to realize that there are a number of organizations who don't necessarily provide actual ed tech solutions that can also help in this process. Um, and we know that uh, the, the DBE and the government can also support by providing effective frameworks and guidelines um, for organizations uh, because we need an explicitly stated set of minimum, like a minimum bar that we need to uh, work towards in order to provide effective interventions. Thank you very much. I think what I'm hearing from you, you didn't actually say what was the top of your tree. Um, Sorry, values are the top I'm of my tree. I'm going to say <laughs> what I'm hearing from you is values. Let's g give an applause. I rather like the idea, actually, of having forgotten to ask her that and then working it out from what she was saying. But I think values in that sense is really important. That uh, if, you, if you are a company that makes a lot of money out of digits, um, by being a, a data provider, a, a, a provider of Wi-Fi, of connectivity or so, and you're making a lot of money out of those digits, then you should be releasing some of that money in some of those digits. Now, something that I've been saying is, if the machines are taking our jobs and doing our work, which they are doing, then they should also be starting to pay our taxes. And it's out of those taxes that the empowerment can start happening. It is just not fair that a company suddenly shuts down an entire sector of the industry because they've digitized it and then they make all that money and they become very wealthy, but they don't put it back. So the values approach, I like that very much. Is there another panelist maybe who would also like to volunteer something? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, Professor Ivala. Thank you, Prof. Kronje. Um, I would also like to say that uh, uh, the highest in my list is uh, values and knowledge because I feel that if you have the right values and you have the knowledge, the understanding and the wisdom, you are empowered and you can make any money you need in the world. I also want to say that uh, for the DBE to implement the, uh, the guidelines um, uh, Dr. Tarling has presented, uh, we need actually to not forget the opportunities COVID-19 gave us. Yes. We already have skills and we need to build on those skills or to use the same strategies we used to learn those skills in inculcating the, the guidelines in our practices. The other thing is that, uh, and in, in panels, there was, there's been a lot of talk of connectivity and all that. And there came a suggestion that uh, um, the DBE should actually think of having a network for all the schools, whereby every school, including those in the villages and rural areas, have got a, a network they can log in. And this is where we can leverage the telecoms and the provision of a zero rating for yes. educational uh, resources. The other thing I need to indicate is that the DBE can also think about in terms of devices, because that is an issue and safety issues. Uh, they can also think of cloud computing, whereby, uh, you, you know, the resources are in the cloud and there is, you can access with 
old computers, old devices, and all that. You don't need to keep on buying devices or supplying devices. You can just access the resources on the cloud. That is something they can investigate. Amazon and other cloud-based uh, 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 services can provide that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that the guidelines are there. What can be done immediately is to try and translate these guidelines into different languages for accessibility and uh, also uh, to ensure that it's accessible to all, everybody in the country. They also need to be in different formats, in Braille, in video, in uh, um, uh, pictures and whatever, so that we cater for different uh, types of uh, learning and the different kinds of learners we have, yeah, and Braille also included. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. Ivala. Um, I think the one key thing that I'm taking from Professor Ivala is the question of the network. Because I remember back in the Stone Age in Cape Town, they used to fly me back from Johannesburg to Cape Town to speak to a place called, can you remember them, the Western Cape Schools Network? And, and out of that grew various initiatives in the Cape. But you see, the power of a network is that you can't break it. Because if I've got a net and my link here is broken, then I can go back and go to the next one or go to the next one again. And so we move the knowledge out of our heads into the system. And so the knowledge suddenly is not dependent on one person, which answers Dr. Tolling's question, what if the champion leaves the building? So if the champion in your school resigns, then the whole thing falls flat. But if you had a network, then there's no more a champion. Everybody is a piece of the champion network. I think that is a, a take-home lesson, and that's why I think you're also correct. Value means sharing. There comes a network. But your second point was knowledge, saying, but you've got to know how to work your network. You've got to know who's around. And, and I think what we also forget is all the knowledge that's around us already anyway, the, the, the knowledges that our learners have about things um, and that we have, but we seem to have two knowledge systems. I know how to use my phone for home, but I don't know how to use my phone for work. So I've got two sets of knowledge. So maybe, yeah, we must have a look. Which brings us to the next uh, question uh, that um, I'm surprised question that I'm going to throw out to the panel. And that would be, how do we address the digital divide in our implementation? Any volunteers? And Dawn, who is principal of a school, and she's going to tell us how she does it and how we could upscale that. Dawn. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Definitely, I am volunteering. <laughs> and values for me always is what drives me wherever I find myself. I'm a principal at Golden Grove in the Western Cape, former Model C school. Before that, however, I was a principal at Bloemfle Primary in the heart of gangland. So the contexts are vastly different. And when I was invited to um, go on this journey with the British Council, I started very skeptically and saying, what do these people really know? Do they understand the very real reality of what principals, teachers, learners are facing in schools on a daily basis? Um, so at the beginning, I was thinking maybe this is not the right place, but I thought as I went along on the journey that this definitely is a beautiful conversation. Because with all the different role players and stakeholders giving input as we went on this year-long journey, you, you had the village. You had everybody from deep rural to central Cape Town giving input about what would be usable, and valuable for our children, no matter where they find themselves in South Africa. And as I was sitting over these three days and listening to all the inputs, um, I was assured as I went along that TBE is considering each and it definitely considering each and every child. But when we say we have to roll out digital standards and another document to us as principals, to <laughs> teachers, when we see another document, we say, oh no, not again not another one of the hundreds of things coming across our desks. But I do believe that with the input, it is honest input. It is input that is real, with, contained within this document that definitely is considering our children. And I realized then, um, as much as at Golden Grove now, even within Golden Grove space, we don't yet have 100% of all of us on board. 
as the principal also, even the way I use my device, the ICT teacher, um, she cringes at the way I do things. I do not put my things in folders, but I always say to her, don't worry about me, I know exactly where to go look for what document. So um, she kind of just leaves me be and then she would come every second or so a week and say, have you updated Miss P? And I would say, oops, forgot. She says there's something vital. So you learn as you go along. But the fact is that children throughout South Africa, no matter where they find themselves, I honestly believe they do have a device. Even if it is the family device of a cell phone, it is something that then can be used to get them onto the different platforms. And so I'm very excited at, the, at what this document has brought to the fore. I'm very excited that I think if we do it correctly and we roll it out properly throughout South Africa to teachers especially, who I believe would have to be the champions, that we make teachers excited and maybe not go into a cascading model, but a model whereby we actually invite all teachers and we re-energize them and make them excited about taking digital standards to all our children wherever we find ourselves. Thank you. So again, we have value up front, and I love what you're talking about, about the IT person cringing. So I'll tell you the story. My daddy got his first computer in, when he was 64 in 2004. And whenever you asked him where something was on the computer, he said, it's in my file. And I couldn't understand what he was saying until I went and looked. And he had on his computer one file. It was a Word document. And every, the file had about 300 pages. And absolutely everything he wrote was in his file. So I had to explain to my daddy that files go into folders. <laughs> and that you make one file for one thing. But there you go. 63, 2004, when computers were still of those that you had to wind up to get to the secretary, he had one and he was prepared to take those chances. And I think that's the, the important one that we have to learn there. And then I believe, Dr. Tolling, you also have um, a, a volunteer bit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we also wanted to talk around the digital divide and looking not only, and our guidelines was very, very explicit when we set out, we didn't want to just take able-bodied um, users into account. We very much wanted to take the whole ecosystem into account. Everybody who has any sort of difference, who learns in any sort of different way, who and create that space that digital learning is for everybody. And when we look at it, um, you know, my mother is 93. You cannot believe how incredibly digitally able she is. And she teaches herself because she wants to. And that's why we brought agency into this. And we wanted to really emphasize the importance of saying, I can and whatever I have, I will use. And creating that space in minds and conversations that it's, it's not because I don't have that I can't. It's whatever I can access, I will. And that's where Dawn was adding that there's so much access already. Let's use the ha low hanging fruit of what's available and build on that. Thank you, Dr. Darling. And what you've just said has now brought, oh, you, you didn't tell us what your top of the tree was, the knowledge, value, virtue. I'm with, with Eunice there, values and knowledge. Value, knowledge, okay. <laughs> I've, I've discovered that you've got to allow people two choices, otherwise it's not gonna work. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna deviate from the program a little. The program says at the end of all this, I've got to open it to the floor so that you can be quiet and then maybe say something and then start getting very noisy. But I thought I'd rather do that now because then we, we bring the audience in and we might take that a bit further. So uh, I'm giving that question. That wasn't on any WhatsApps, by the way. I'm going off script here. Um, but I'm going to ask you as the audience the same two questions. Is what are the low-hanging fruits and how are we addressing the digital divide? And my question is, are there any of you here who can tell us a bit about the low-hanging fruits and how you are crossing the divide. And I see one there. Is there somebody running around with a mic? Otherwise, I'll have to run around with a mic. I've got one to run around. Dr. Tarling's going to run around with her mic. And she's going to go to that gentleman there. I'm sorry I went off script. I should have told the mic people that we were going to do that. But hey, they wouldn't have asked me if I were boring. <laughs> yes, sir. Good morning, my name is Rian van der Berg. I'm with FEDSAS, the Governing Body Association, and I live in 2024. Yeah. Um, 
I think the first question is, the low-hanging fruits is there because, yeah, how, how do I put this best? Because we define that there are high-hanging fruits. Yes. We, we, we look at the problem with a problem mindset. Yes. And not with a solution mindset. Yeah. I've heard the word digital divide more than I've heard the word digital bridge. Yes. And if we look at the number of devices, the people that have devices, we should not have problems. Yeah. I think Pepcor sold, <coughs> sold over 4 million wow. smartphones last year. Yeah. And that's the low end of the market. Yeah. So somehow, I think we're defining ourselves into the problem side rather than into the solution side. Yes. And that is the low-hanging fruit. We have to change our mindset. Yes. Before we can get to the point of changing the rest of the world's mindset. Yes. Yeah, so that's my input. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that deserves a round of applause. I, I want to take, I want to go exactly, and I want to share with you, I think it's Dr. Marion Walton who told the story about the, the library. So, so here's this library, and it's in a very troubled area, and it's across the highway from the school, and there's a bridge from the school to the library. And every afternoon when school finishes, the kids find it's unsafe, to, the learners, find it's unsafe to be at the school. So they run across the bridge to the library to go and do their homework there. And in the library are one or two public computers and a security guard who looks after those public computers. And now there's a queue in front of the computers because the learners are all asking for the same information. So the security guard has learned to find out what the information is that the learners need, and then the security guard would search for that information in the morning so that when the learners come, he can just give them memory sticks and say, plug this into your phone, and you've get, got the information already because he can't have all these people in front of his machines. But then he discovered that actually they didn't want to plug their machines in, their, their phones in just to get the information. They also needed electricity. So then he went around to the other people in the library and said, please bring me your spare charges. And so he built a whole charger bank in the one side for the, for the learners to be able to charge their machines, and he had these memory sticks with which he gave them. So the learners became realized that the person that gives them the information they need in the library is the security guard. And the librarian stood at the door making sure that the children don't steal the books. So I just wanted to show you how our lives can turn through 180 degrees if we don't think through what we are doing. Um, who else, ladies and gentlemen, would like to share something? Okay, so the audience is a bit shy now. There's a, there's a non-shy audience. This is a good table. Um, I didn't bring my Smarties along, otherwise I'd have given that table some Smarties. But you've got Sweeties anyway. Take some there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm standing up. Good. Stand up to me. As a teacher, we don't talk. She's a teacher, she stands up. We yeah. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, my name is Ngele Yvonne Lechaba. I'm head of registration for South African Council for Educators. Right. Um, I was part of the Western Schools Network uh, process. I was part of the 2004 when computers were introduced. Yes. I took part in training teachers across the, uh, the country. Right. I was one of the school net trainers. Right. Okay, fine. Um, talking about the low-hanging fruits, SAIS has a platform. I had our professors, our colleagues, talking about guidelines, knowledge, information. If those documents are not shared with the wider yes. uh, community of our educators. They will not make any difference. SAIS as a professional body have a platform for enabling that process to happen. So I'm not only talking to them, I'm also talking to other uh, professional uh, development uh, colleagues in the room and out there yes. to say let's Let's prepare and package our programs well so that we are not left behind. We talk a digital school, we talk a digital learner, 
but there are no professional development programs and guidelines available and accessible. Let's use the SAIS a platform for doing that because it is also our duty to make sure that continuing a professional development digitally happens. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. So the South African Council for Educators, and I'm sure that it's also a value proposition that we've been given here. Um, and, and I think something that you said, ma'am, that really resonates with me, and I'm going to use my word instead of yours, but it's about curating. I think one of the problems is that we've got this information. You can find it on YouTube, you can find it on Google, you can find it on everybody's sites, but nobody knows where to look. And our problem has shifted from having too little information to too much information. I don't know if you've ever gone into a library and asked a librarian for a certain book, and then she'd come back to you and say, no, I haven't got a book on this, but I've got five books on something else. And say, so, well, that isn't helping me. I only need the one book on the right thing. And I think that's the big problem we have at the moment with the internet, and specifically now that we've got ChatGPT and her friends online, is that they lie. So we're not sure about information, and so that's why we need curated information. And if we have these various portals, then we're going to need to have a portal on top of that. Because I know the information is there, I just don't know where to look for it. So that curation thing that you said, ma'am, and then training people where to look for it, I think is very important. I think we now have had our two sessions, uh, some, anybody, one more person down here. Yes, ma'am. Is it a ma'am? I can't see that. I must really get, do you know that I failed my driver's license test because they said I can't see anymore. So now they suggested that I actually have a white stick out of the door when I drive. Uh, good morning, I'm Hema Hariram from NAPTOSA, the Teachers' Union. And um, before I get to what we're doing, how we're bridging as an organization, I just want to ask from a labor perspective, uh, the digital skills standards. We have Education International, which has professional teaching standards. And our, before COVID, they adapted with the advancements of technology. They too did research and looked at digital standards and the importance and prioritizing pedagogy. And SACE aligned their professional teaching standards to the EI. So at some point, if you could share, have you looked and incorporated those teaching standards? Um, and then from a, our perspective here in South Africa, four or six years ago, we were included in the engagement of this digital standards. Yes. Two days. Yes. And that was it. We never heard anything. We were invited last week again yes. for another two days after the fact. So how Labour's voice, the voice of the teachers, right. or the 420,000 plus has been incorporated there. I, I can't understand how. You've had your small village engagements, but listening to the teacher's voice, where does it reflect in this digital guidelines that you have presented? That for us is a concern. And then in terms of how, what we're doing to help the situation, uh, in terms of um, a teacher organization, we actually have um, embarked and taken up the teacher union collaboration and assisting in ruling out digital skills where we, uh, with the, uh, the um, um, engagement of Intel, we are able to assist in rolling out basic uh, computer skills uh, in terms of using, uh, maximizing the use of Word, right. Right. Uh, your Excel and yes. your PowerPoint and integration. So that's what we're doing. We're in our third year as unions, and we're also doing coding and robotics, um, okay. plugged and unplugged through the DBE TUC program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really happy that I went off script and got this information in here. I'm going to ask Dr. Tarling to respond a little bit because I think what you're doing is a very valuable contribution. Dr. Tarling. So one of the big things that we did when we did the literature review when we started was to look at all the standards that are available around the world. And we didn't want to just go and copy paste what's being done in other countries. We use the standards that have been developed. We use that as part of our input document. Everybody looked at it. And then we created our own standards based on the priorities that we have in South Africa. 
Um, I think our priorities are unique to us. Yes, they're very similar to other countries, but they're very much unique to us. And we wanted to also bring in the voice of parents um, because in a lot of standards, the voice of parents and communities are not heard. But like we were listening to some of the speakers talking around Ubuntu, talking around our philosophy that we are together, that is for us was important and, and that wasn't always very visible in some of the other standards. Um, and then when it came to our engagement and who we invited, we literally put this out to so many people. We worked with a DBE. We had a database of hundreds of people that we invited. Some never responded. We invited all the different um, role players. We invited labor unions. We invited, um, and, and personally, I personally messaged union members that I, uh, or, or leaders that I knew, um, sending them the invitations. It came from the DBE, it came from the British Council. So if it's some way lost in a spam, I'm so sorry that we, we're not allowed to spam you. So, <laughs> but we did send out invitations. We also put it on social media as much as possible so that we could have as many different voices. And from that came voices of teachers who, who follow. And I, I know that my friends on social media um, a lot of them shared it further and further and further. So when we had the online engagements, we would have teachers from the Eastern Cape on their phone joining us yes. on Google Meet. Or we would have teachers from Pumalanga and, um, you know, everywhere across the country. It, this isn't a small village job. It was literally people from all over who volunteered their time in six different online sessions just for a group on parents or just for a group on on teachers, and they, they were putting in their input, so it was definitely a collaborative space where anybody who wanted to become part of it was welcome. Thank you, Dr. Sarling. I, I agree. It, it was fascinating. I've been involved in implementing computers in schools in South Africa since 1993, and um, this has certainly been the biggest single thrust that, that I've seen, and it really excites me because I think we've, the time has become quite right now. And so now I'm going to go back to the next um, secret question. And that question is the guidelines that uh, Dr. Tarling shared with us is for learners, educators, educational leaders, parents and communities, and institutions. And so the question that I asked to the panel is, where do we start implementing this? Now they're going to speak together um, as a choir. Okay. <laughs> Prof. Yunus, go first. Yes, um, with the implementation, I think advocacy is really crucial on these guidelines and that the DBE should embark on that uh, to all stakeholders of what uh, uh, the guidelines have we've developed and sell them. And uh, they need also to uh, design strategies of how the implementation will be uh, taking place. Um, suggestions are, uh, you can have workshops. We know workshops are not that effective, but they are very important. Uh, you can design micro-credentials. These are very short, short courses on the digital standards, which can be in different languages. Uh, you can develop a MOOC. This is a massive online educational course on the digital guidelines which can be placed on the whatever platform the teachers, parents, and students can be able to access them. And uh, the other thing is that uh, higher education institutions and other institutions are preparing pre-service and in-service teachers. Uh, they should be engaged to include these guidelines into the curriculum of preparing these teachers. Um, in terms of uh, the learners, we should also engage schools and see how the guidelines can be infused into the subject's curriculums as one of the outcomes in each subject. subject. The other thing is that uh, we cannot just roll out the whole thing at a go. Our suggestion is that uh, we do a pilot, small pilot, with each stakeholders and learn lessons from it and improve, and then a plant scale up can be done for implementation. And we suggest that uh, in the scaling up, a school-based approach 
of training can be adopted or circuit-based uh, approach or district-based approach. And very important is that monitoring and evaluation should be embedded in the implementation from the beginning and documented. And then the other thing is that process documentation from advocacy to the monitoring and evaluation and all the processes should be documented because we would like to say that uh, South Africa will be one of the uh, African countries to come up with the uh, digital guidelines and you want to be an exemplar for the rest of the, the Africa. And if you've uh, processed document, documentation, any country can look at what you did and adopt and learn, get insights from you and all that. Uh, this is an aspect donor, uh, donor funders really would like to, to see it from DBE. And I'm, I'm going to stop you there. Yeah, because thank you. No, I think this one is working, yeah. <laughs> um, so just, just to build on what Prof. Yunus was saying was that um, uh, it, there are existing frameworks yeah. for efficacy uh, that, that we can use. Uh, in order to create snapshots of where schools are. So if we look at an efficacy matrix of uh, schools' readiness in terms of uh, teacher readiness, community readiness, um, you know, re readiness of the, of the environment to adopt this ICT um, uh, implementation, and then look at infrastructure readiness, uh, does the school have network, does the school have Wi-Fi, does the school have devices, like that, that sort of um, infrastructure readiness, I think we can very quickly get an idea of where schools are at. And we need to, uh, we need to remember that uh, each school is based in a very different context. And we need to take that into account um, and that we, we need to meet the schools where they are at. Uh, and the communities where they are at as well, because this is not just uh, this is not just limited to a school. I think it needs to include communities as a broader perspective. Um, and in providing snapshots like that, and providing a, a very clear list of uh, or, or steps, very clear steps through which these schools and communities need to move, we can, we can move schools and communities through a, a list of requirements very, very quickly, especially if we leverage the existing public-private partnerships. Um, and we can, we can get communities involved, organizations involved, and, and we, can, we can use this process to move our schools through this process very quickly to integrate them into this ICT implementation. Thank Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now exactly 10 past, which is the time that we've been contracted to do. And so therefore the, word, the last word goes to Dr. Tarling and her question that she WhatsApped me to ask her is what are next steps? And with that, goodbye. Sorry, brief, prof. Just before Dr. Tolling takes over, I just want to add on to what my two colleagues said. Okay, now you're in their time. Yeah, no, one, <laughs> one, let's take one minute. I just want to, on behalf of teachers and principals out there, many of them are very tired. Many of them are overwhelmed. So this is absolutely fantastic. But I think when we look at a rollout, we need to look at getting our teachers excited. And it's going to take a huge effort to get many of our teachers, and I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart, because I'm interacting on a daily basis with teachers, not only at my school, but within my various networks. Principals are burnt out. We need to get our teachers and principals to a point then when we are rolling this out to get them really, really excited. And I think ways we can do that, obviously, um, it would be, a, I think, a huge campaign to get them excited about doing this because it is really something that must be done. But I would like to say at the end of all of this that we have reached all our children in South Africa, no matter where they can find themselves, and we've taken hands with all colleagues across South Africa to take it to our children. So I just needed to add that. One, one second from you, Dr. Tarling, then back to the chair. Okay, one second from me. So what we're doing is we're, we're working with the DBE, um, who's, they have been incredible in supporting this whole journey. 
and taking now the ICT strategy or what we'll call the digital learning strategy, whatever it would be called, and aligning the digital guidelines and the digital strategy. And eventually we want to have one voice talking everywhere in all our schools, in all our provinces around digital learning and making sure that the strategy is supportive of every school's unique and individual journey. That's the next step. Uh, let's uh, thank the panel uh, under the uh, leadership of uh, Prof. Cronier. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Kosa, let me tell you how wrong I was in my ranking. I started with money. <laughs> because, be because, because in my reading of uh, the literature of digitization, uh, the scholars are saying, uh, Data is tomorrow's money. Then I said the first thing that I will need would be data, which is tomorrow's money in the context of this conversation. Thereafter, then I went to values to say, once I get that data, how do I use that data? I must use it correctly and responsibly to get information so that I can teach my learners better with more information. Thereafter, then, uh, I get to knowledge. Being a person with values, then I get the knowledge that is relevant for my practice. And once I get that knowledge, I empower the learners to be better citizens. That is my wrong uh, ranking uh, looking at the theme. But thank you very much for that. I just give them a round of applause. <laughs> Prof, we thank you for managing this in such a way that uh, we save time. And uh, there was not even a single second or a second or even an impetus of a minute lost thank you on top of it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much for uh, taking part in this. We now know that digitization is a big tree. It has low hanging fruit. It has mid midly hanging fruits and high hanging fruits. Uh, you can start at any point in time, and that is important. Uh, for your good listening and your good participation, you will be rewarded uh, with a, a tea break where you need to come back at uh, 25 past nine. Thank you.
10 years is a very important milestone and to pay tribute um, the board minister in a story of collaboration 10 years of social capital building for education improvement we all can play a very important role in the quality of education in the country and create hope so happy birthday to the NEC team but I want to say a particular happy birthday not to the people with the scenes the sex help us make this thing work um, hi I'm Brian Fleisch I'm professor of education yes. policy and just <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about something to say. Ten years of NT, I've only been part of like two and a half. I hope to be a part of more years. For the next 10 years and the next decade after, and the other decade that I need to get it. Well, I would like to congratulate uh, the organizations that set up in the team. Uh, I want to say happy birthday to National Education Collaboration Trust. 10 years is a fantastic achievement. I feel very privileged to have been part of the journey. I feel very great mind, highly regarded, highly respected, and some of the best people in, it's in the inner city where I just believe to raise a child. We have all villagers coming to say, this is our child, we may not agree on your vision, but these are the common parameters for our child. So it was a beautiful thing, and I'm very grateful for that.
10 years is the very and I really want to pay you to um, board and work. A story of collaboration. 10 years of social capital building for education improvement. All can play in improving the quality of education in the country and create hope. So, happy birthday. birthday not the people we normally see but to the people we have seen the secretaries and the cleaners who help make this thing work i'm Ron flash professor of education policy at the university of the river and just and oh okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was thinking about something to say. Ten years of any only been part of like two and a half. I hope to be a part of more years. For the next ten years and the next decade and the other decade up. Well, I would like to congratulate uh, the organizations that set up the university. Uh, birthday to National Education Collaboration Trust is a fantastic achievement. I'm privileged to have of the and I feel Great minds, highly regarded, highly respected, and the best people in the kids. And it's in the NEC where it takes a village to raise it. We have all villages coming. This is a house. We may not agree on the various systems, we may not agree on the, but these are the parameters that we all have for our child. So it was. still having their tea, let us have a working tea. Come with your cup of tea so that we proceed. Can we organize that uh, colleagues who are outside come, into the, come back to the room? We are moving on. If all the delegates can come back, from the tea break. We will now receive reports, back presentations from com com commissions. Uh, we will do that in a chronological order. And each presenter will be allocated 20 minutes and should adhere to the 20 minutes so that we keep time. 
The first presentation will be Commission One. Uh, they are reporting on transition from school to work, uh, basing it on developing and implementing modernized assessment strategies for the 21st century. Where is the reporter? Can we load the presentation for Commission One? Good morning to the Minister and good morning to the Deputy Minister. And also I pass my greetings to all the villagers who are in this room and also those that are joining online. Um, my job is easy because I'm reporting and I'm delegated by Commission One. So already they made their input and I'm hoping that I'll be able to uh, represent them well. So our commission looked at the transition from school to work, developing and implementing a modernized assessment strategy for the 21st century and beyond. The purpose of this commission was to establish the status of the current assessment regime uh, in the schooling sector and to highlight the challenges. And also the purpose was to explore the core assessment principles and practices that, were, that will address the current assessment challenges and support a competency framework. And I must keep on reminding myself that it is not a competency-based framework, but it is a competency framework. So all of us, we must get that right. I was reminded yesterday, so it's very important. It's not a competency-based framework, but a competency framework. Um, we know that there, there has been a technological revolution. So due to technological advancement in the world, uh, you know, there are changes requiring education systems to adapt in order to prepare learners for the future. In response to this, the DBE continuously make efforts to, to amend and to revise the curriculum. And you, we strengthen, we know that, you know, the presentations that have been done uh, throughout the days, the past days during this Lohota, you know, it was alluded that the DBE is doing a lot of work to strengthen the curriculum, to make it current and to make it relevant. So uh, as part of this ongoing process, uh, a competency framework has been developed and it has been adopted. Then what are the implications for assessment? And we were also reminded that we usually change the curriculum, but the assessment is always uh, lagging behind. So this commission was looking at that to say, how do we now rethink and reimagine assessment to ensure that it is current, it is relevant, and it tests what we wanted to test. The purpose of assessment in simple terms, assessment makes learning visible. And the, the primary purpose then uh, of assessment is to improve the students' uh, learning and the teaching as both students and teacher respond to the information it provides. Then this was quoted from the curriculum uh, of New Zealand. The educational imperative is as follows. Learners who can think critically and creatively use evidence to support their solutions to complex problems and, community, and communicate clearly. That is why we are educating our learners. Now, the question is that how do we then assess? 
then the imperative for assessment will be to evaluate that learners are on track to achieve uh, the goal that we, are, we have set for ourselves. The questions that guided and fo uh, helped to focus the commissioner as follows then, how do we use an AFL approach to assess a broader set of skills that feature in the competency framework? And also we looked at school-based assessment. You know, there has always been debates about school-based assessment that in policy it is very good, but there are challenges with implementation. And then as the commission now, we said to ourselves, and then school-based assessment in its current for, uh, format does not deliver uh, on its intended purpose. How do we reimagine re uh, school-based assessment to diversify assessment? And also what changes all amendments or alternative assessment forms must be made to existing NSC examinations to align the final NS, uh, NSC to the broader domains of the competency framework. We know very well that our system is, uh, you know, is driven by high stakes examinations where we are really focusing on, you know, percentages and the league tables. Then the question is that how then do we rethink uh, that kind of examination to make sure that we align with the competency framework? The 2024 Lekhota recommendations that we are putting here, it's, uh, you know, number one, we say, evaluate the impact and effectiveness of current AFL training uh, programs with the aim of ensuring effective implementation of AFL in all classrooms in South Africa. So when we were engaging, we have learned that there's an, a concept document that has been drafted, but then we are saying, let's take that concept uh, document forward. Let's take it through the different uh, uh, commis committees of uh, the DBE to make sure that it is adopted, it is approved, so that when we implement it, then we are scaling. And then also evaluate the impact of the training in teaching. In this case, we wanted to acknowledge that there is a lot that, of work that has been done by the unions in training teachers uh, for AFL to make sure that they are, you know, they, they, they are meeting the requirements uh, or the, the expertise that they need to implement a, AFL effectively. So it was that then that we have that kind of a small scale training of teachers. It is how, how then do we evaluate it and make sure that we strengthen the training programs so that they can be nationwide. So in this case, the commission really appreciated that the, you know, the unions are doing a lot of work in this regard. Um, also to say the future training should include all officials. Often at times you find that we train teachers, but we don't include uh, SMT and other relevant stakeholders. So the, the commission here is proposing that should we, or when we continue with the training, let's ensure that all the people that you know, are responsible uh, for, for, for this AFL must be taken aboard because you cannot have a teacher that understands the processes and the implementation while the people that will be super, supervising them, they don't understand what is being done. So the other thing is that we need to, uh, to establish communities of practices. We, 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 when we were talking about this, we said there are pockets of excellence in schools. There are teachers that are able to implement AFL and they are doing it very well. So how do we then make sure that we, they, we, we, we enhance the communities of practices to make sure that teachers coach, teachers uh, mentor each other and they guide each other as they implement. You know, it's, it's, it, there, there's no better way to learn than to learn from your peer. And also to create and share existing good practices on AFL and leverage technology to enhance teacher training. We have learned throughout this Lokota that technology is here and its advancement should be acknowledged and we, we should not fear taking, uh, uh, using technology really to better our practices. Therefore, it can also assist in issues of AFL. The other thing that we discussed was the, to re-establish the original intent and principles of SBA and how SBA can be gradually transformed to ensure it, uh, it achieves the, its original intent and form and thereby being aligned to the competency framework. I think we, we should, you know, appreciate the fact that South Africa, uh, in Africa, we, we were one of the earliest uh, countries to take upon uh, the implementation of SBA. 
and the intent was very good. But then again, we should acknowledge that we do have limitations. Then the, the question here is that how do we then strengthen our implementation of SBA to make sure that we get the full benefits uh, from this uh, good uh, intervention in schools? So number one, the commission decided that we should conduct research on how SBA needs uh, to be transformed so that it achieves its intended purpose. Uh, number two, develop uh, a guideline on performance-based assessment and how it can be used to support the competency-based uh, framework. We, we, here we were simply saying that we, if we are going to achieve the aspirations of the competency framework, we should not uh, approach it like we are approaching the summative assessment. Uh, where, you know, all, all, always we look at the, the NSC uh, in terms of the exit examinations, and then we tend to drive ourselves towards the exit examinations. But in this case, when we deal with school-based assessment, let's rethink and uh, approach it differently. Uh, we need to train teachers to set quality alternative forms of assessment that are related to everyday experiences. The more we make our learning authentic and the more we, we, we approach it in, to solve the real life issues, and then it will better our children. We want children that will be able to have values. We, we heard a lot about values this morning to say we need to be able to, to, to produce learners that are able to take up uh, you know, initiatives uh, informed by values. So if we approach it looking at real life problems, we will be able to really ensure that we, we meet the aspirations of the competency framework. And also, we must ensure that the teacher in the classroom is the custodian of all SBA processes. You know, as the Department of Basic Education and the districts and the provinces, we, we, we get frustrated because teachers are not capacitated maybe to develop good SBA tasks. Then we come up with things like common tests. Then as long as it is not developed at the school, it is not a school-based assessment. So school-based assessments must be developed by teachers, must be ad administered by teachers, and it also have to be marked by teachers. You know, we have to build a teacher that we are co confident they, they are autonomous in, as they implement uh, SBA. So we should be able to, to, to trust the system in such a way that our teachers are given that uh, opportunity to implement uh, SBA. The next one, review the SBA program of assessment. In this case, we are saying review the number and form of assessment tasks included as part of uh, the program of assessment and also ensure a spread of alternative tasks, adopt the use of technology as an enabler to support assessment. You know, we heard a lot, uh, the use of WhatsApp. Uh, there, there are so many platforms that have been created, zero-rated platforms. Then how do we now leverage those platforms to ensure that SBA is as effective as we would like? it to be. Um, also, in, in the, we have investigate modernized models of high-stake examination that are administered internationally. Is to say that there were a lot of things that were said to say, you know, the way we are examining, we will drive how we teach in the classroom. We know now that we have parallel systems. We have the DBE system where we have, you know, the the normal periods during the day where learners are taught, but then we have an, another system where learners are taught at night, they sleep at, uh, you know, in, at schools, that you, uh, you pass during the weekend, you will see that, the, the, you know, there is washing on the lines. It's a different system that is, is, is running because we are driven by examination, uh, examination system that we want to make sure that our learners, uh, you know, achieve certain percentages. And then, but we are saying that maybe there are better ways that we can, you know, improve our system without really, you know, drilling the learners and making sure that they are able to recall everything when they write their examination. So it was a request that we need to look at various high stakes models uh, in the world. Number two, review the current NSC question papers and establish how they can be improved to be aligned with competency assessment to say if we are going to, to develop the question items like we are developing them right now, then we will be defeating the purpose. We must investigate how, how can we then infuse competencies in the question items that we develop uh, from here onward. Then select question papers then in two subjects and conduct an evaluation of these question papers and how they can improve to assess uh, competences. 
investigates ways to assess multiple domains of the competency framework. Then we said draft a concept document for discussion on various types and forms of assessment uh, for high stakes examination. Also establish a multidimensional task team uh, to action and lead this recommendation. And then the last one that we have reviewed the examination model and the associated quality assurance model, collaborate with Umalusi to establish a short, medium, and long-term plan for the modernization of examination. This, in this year, we are just saying that the entire cycle of examination from test development to quality assurance, we need to revamp and rethink it if we are to achieve the competency framework uh, aspirations. And then in conclusion here, we are saying assessment is a key driver to achieve uh, systemic and behavioral change. And then we are saying now improvement in the quality of assessment is a long journey, it's not going to be easy. Then therefore we have to really work out, do our research so that all the, the, the decision that we take here will be informed by research. Then teacher development is central to assessment revolution. So we are saying that teacher development should not just be an event and it cannot just be a workshop or five days. It needs to be a, a process. It must start from implementing and it must be evaluated and we need to monitor and see the impact of the programs that we are putting in the system. Uh, the last one, the assessment should not merely serve a certification purpose, but make teaching and learning visible. So assessments must, you know, the feedback loop when it comes to assessment must be there so that you will improve the teaching practice and the learning practice. Um, while I'm standing here, I cannot resist this minister. And, you know, I, I just have to announce that Umalusi is organizing a conference on assessment uh, in Cape Town. So the theme of the the conference is reimagining educational assessment in the age of multiple dimensions of learning in a global society. So I'm putting this because this is relevant to these discussions and um, we will be there in August and we are still taking papers. Uh, so I, I hope that you will submit and when you go to our website, you will see that the conference call is there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the announcement for Manus was not budgeted for <laughs> uh, in the time at our disposal, but please note that. Uh, colleagues, this is how we are going to deal with this. Uh, note the questions or comments that you want to make, because uh, when we, I mean, after the last uh, commission, uh, we will open the platform for additions and comments. Uh, so we'll take all the commissions first. Uh, the second uh, presentation or report will be done by Mr. Basil Manuel on Commission 2. And uh, the, their discussion was based on the need for proper recruitment, induction, and service professional development for improving learning outcomes. Over to you, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Madam Minister, Deputy Minister, I greet you as well, and I know that Barney has done the protocols, so I'm not going to repeat them. Um, I've been asked to, to report on Commission 2. Now, Commission 2 uh, addressed the need for proper recruitment, induction, and in-service professional development. Uh, in improving learner outcomes. Now, just before I pitch into it, I need to say that there were three presentations made, and um, two of the presentations didn't necessarily answer the question that I'm expected to report on. But nevertheless, um, it was slightly to the side of it, uh, broadly speaking, and I'll point that out. And um, however, we are reporting on it, and we will 
make some recommendations as is required. So here goes. Just before I do that, uh, since we are in this advert part, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm from the Union Naptoza, of course. And um, I need to, to also just say that the union's presence here is not because we are good looking, but that too. <laughs> the other part is because it's a legislative requirement that the unions be consulted. And that is where the, the role we play. But we are a team. We work with the ministry. And this particular minister, I'm sorry I can't see you too well, minister, but this particular minister has been exceptional in ensuring that the unions are consulted. And now I pitch into the rest. Barney? Is it changing there? Ah, there we go. So the first question was on research and... Um, it was how research and data collection inform the matching of demand and supply in relation to the output of graduates with the correct specialization. Now, one of the important things that was reported here too in the plenary was that there's no aggregate shortage of teachers. That, however, that is when we are just comparing the number to the number. Then we don't have a shortage. However, there are far fewer foundation phase teachers produced. As a result, and in fact, the, 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 the disparity is so large that you find that the vast majority of people are going into either the senior primary or into the FET phase, find themselves even in the junior primary. Minister, with the issue of reading, there is no way on the good Lord's green earth that somebody who trained for FET is going to be able to teach reading. And that is where the disjuncture lies. But in the end result, there's a lack of enrollment planning, it would seem, in DHET. Now the question is not ours to answer, but rather to point a finger and say, where is the problem? Is it because of a lack of instruction to universities by DHET? Or further down the value chain from DBE to DHET to the universities? But there certainly is a disjuncture. Because if we continue to, to train people for the wrong phases, the problem is not going to resolve itself. Okay. Okay. I'm still on the same issue. So as a result of this uh, overtraining on some side and undertraining on another, um, there are a large number of teachers teaching out of phase and specialization. But there is a, a small point to make that even though a lot of people are not teaching what they necessarily majored in, they may be teaching something that they did study. But compounding the problem will be the introduction of new subjects. Because the problem just gets larger, it doesn't get smaller. A point was made about the HEIs having to produce at least 20% more than they are currently producing by 2030 if, if pupil-teacher ratios improve, if infrastructure improves, and of course, but over and above that, remember the school population is increasing. So currently 50% of teachers trained are not absorbed in the Purcell system, but that doesn't mean that they've evaporated into thin air. SGB posts, private schooling, and going abroad is what happens. And we don't want everybody to be trained here and run abroad. We can't afford that as a country. So some recommendations. Um, better demand co uh, coordination between DBE, DHET, and, H and HEIs. So what we want, we must be upfront about. But of course, it depends on whether at the lowest end in the DBE, we know what we want so that we can inform the other ends. Increasing demand for planning and coordination in the years ahead. And of course, a point that was made was that data is available, but not always shared 
with everybody. And that leaves you with a little bit blind on the one side. Researchers are reporting on things, but if they had more data, sometimes cleaner data, sometimes better data, what they inform the DBE about will obviously be better. So improvement in conditions, infrastructure, learner-teacher ratios will change the scenario as we move on. To move on to the next question, the second presentation was on induction programs and how induction programs contribute to improving new teacher efficacy and retention. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes um, it seems that when we talk induction, it's a nice, warm, fuzzy, woolly thing. It can't be. There was general commonality in the room on the importance of induction. Number one, to help the beginner teacher to settle down to master the art of teaching. Teaching is not because you've been in a school, you went to school yourself, can you teach? There are some people that hold that notion, but that is not teaching. That you are able to manage classes and improve discipline, but also to improve job satisfaction and even happiness. Because happiness is important too. And as an end result, improve retention. Because Survey, surveys conducted show that many people want to run for the hills because primarily they are not being assisted. And of course, the bullying of new teachers is rife. And with a proper induction system, we could probably uh, deal with some of this. Induction is, is made provision for, by the way, in section 3.2 of the PUM. Uh, the policy provisions are there and it is not a choice. It is mandatory that we should have an induction program. Now this speaks to um, policy and policy not being implemented fully. There's no saying that there are no um, induction programs. However, uh, induction is not commonly practiced or of sufficient duration. Some people think it's the first week, walk the teacher around the school and say, there you are, now you know, this is us, carry on. And it can't be like that. It depends on the school environment, on the mentor-mentee relationship, but the research that was presented also shows that the entire school must be vested in teacher induction. to then bring this to an end. The, 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 the research shows on the small scale that it was done that it impacted positively on teacher well-being. They felt better for their hands being held and shown certain things. It certainly improved pedagogy. It certainly resulted in better relationship and if I even may dare say protection against the bullying that sometimes happens, but a much greater sense that they can deal with the challenges, the efficacy. But they were also more positive about staying in the profession. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to find uh, a national um, plan, induction plan, grounded in the ISP uh, FTED, but it must be there and evenly implemented throughout the country. It must be mandatory. It can be linked to probation. But it, it targets, of course, the new teachers, but then we also have foreign teachers coming in for which the, the, the country's um, ethos is a little different or school ethoses are a little different to what they are accustomed to. And of course, those teachers who've had a long break must also still be inducted. And that having been the second question. The third one ties in with a lot of what was said here in the plenary in the last couple of days. It's about two weeks eh, that we've been here. So how digital learning can contribute to increasing the scale and learning impact of teacher professional development, thereby promoting skills for the changing world. Now, this particular presentation uh, dealt a lot with how people feel about um, professional development. And 
very little about the upscaling of it. However, there were certain things we could deduce. And one of the obvious things was that digital learning uh, and utilizing digital learning for professional development has the potential to reach many, many more educators for uh, teacher development for improved quality classroom practice. We know that. We've seen it. However, there are a whole lot of people who are afraid of this. And that is where the presentation became very useful. Teachers being able to decide what to choose because there are so many possibilities when it's online as opposed to calling people into a grand meeting. Uh, we we, had a, we spoke uh, to, uh, in great detail about what teachers need to know in the changing world. But one of the core things that came through, besides all these need-to-know skills, it was also about, uh, about humanizing technology so that people aren't afraid to, number one, use it. Number two, they are not afraid uh, not to be in a great gathering. Uh, that they can do this in their own time, and that they want to do this. It's about engagement with the teachers, and it is also about ensuring that it's not only about the content. One of the things about the distance with uh, technology is that it sometimes is cold, and it, 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 it ignores all those soft skills that we need teachers to have. So the content designers must be aware that it is far more than just content. Um, ICT must listen to the voices of teachers in terms of what they want, what they need, where the shoe is pinching, and the like. So, just to complete, no, surely not. Okay. Okay. That completed the, f the, the third question. The fourth question was not about us reporting here. It was simply just about, so where are we with the ISP FTED? First of all, we were just informed, and in much longer than I'm going to say, that uh, the plan is at the write-up stage, and that sometime this year, the writing up would be done, and then we would have an opportunity to look up, to look at the, write, at the writing, and then see uh, if we are all um, happy about it. So, this is a recapture of the uh, recommendations. Utilizing data, align EMS, SAMS, and SA SAMS, to uh, access teacher qualification data. Because if we want to know if everybody's in alignment or why people are out of alignment, you need deeper data than just that they are teachers or that they are some of. I think I, I, I disappeared a little. Then HEIs must be given targets for enrollment, uh, for enrollment funding, sorry, to shape the supply of teachers. I made a lot about that. A national scaling up of, of the um, induction plan, the a national induction plan. And of course, um, as we move deeper and deeper into digital learning, to start not only recognizing, but exploiting the potential that we have to utilize this, but not to forget that our teachers are sometimes craving for more um, soft skills. Mr. Chair. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. I've got to leave. I've got to go into another meeting, but I'll come back. Okay. Uh, thank you, Basil. Uh, indeed, you are a very important stakeholder as teacher unions. With you, sometimes we agree to disagree, and sometimes we disagree to agree with you, all in the interest of the sector. Uh, we are going to take the third uh, report. Uh, please note uh, your inputs or your questions. Uh, the third one will be done by uh, Mr. Tabane uh, around the issue of e-education transformation through the use of ICT post-COVID-19. 
uh, you have a budget of 20 minutes. Uh, good morning, uh, Minister, um, Deputy Minister, and uh, let me stand on the protocol that has been established. I'm representing Commission Number Three um, that dealt with the issue of um, e-education transformation through the use of ICTs uh, in the era that we find ourselves post-COVID. Uh, the Commission focused. Uh, on a number of areas, uh, including facilitating inclusive and equitable access to education through the use of technologies, enhancing curriculum delivery and learning experiences through the effective use of technologies, as well as fostering sustainable development through robust partnerships that leverage technology in education. Um, the, the context uh, within which uh, the Commission worked uh, was around issues of connectivity, issues of online platforms, issues of uh, teacher training, uh, issues of uh, assessments, and uh, so the work is cross-cutting in nature, touching on all the commissions uh, that were here with the whole issue of inclusion uh, and improving teaching and learning in the 21st century. Um, we had eight questions that we had to respond to, and uh, I will not be uh, spending time on this slide as those questions are going to appear in the next uh, uh, commissions. I think I will take a cue from uh, the commissions that presented before me. Uh, I will not spend time on the 2023 Lekota progress, but we'll skip those slides and uh, then zoom into the 2024 recommendations and use the allocated time for that. Um, the, the, the first area of focus was around issues of ICT infrastructure, and as I indicated earlier on, to create access to one, these uh, resources, two, and most importantly, access education using these resources as tools for, for doing that. The first question was, uh, how is basic education sector uh, ensuring equitable access to ICT infrastructure and resources across all our schools? And um, the... Um, the, the commission came with the recommendation, the following recommendation that says the sector should ensure that all schools have access to reliable internet connectivity suitable for both teaching, learning, as well as administration. Um, and secondly, that uh, the SA Connect policy led by the Department of Communication and Digital, Digital Technologies phase two implementation will bring connectivity to 18,000 schools across the country and that we need to develop a centralized platform to map, monitor, and track the connectivity status of all schools working with our partners and that we need to ensure access to fit for purpose ICT devices, including for our learners with special education needs. The Commission also recommended that DBE uh, to think of establishing an education network that should be accessed by all schools at no cost, zero rated. We know it is possible. DHET has established one. All 27 universities are connected to the Sunrun infrastructure, high-speed broadband connectivity pushing huge big data that is research related. And uh, they are bringing all the TVET colleges now into this network. If they did it, we can did it. <laughs> uh, Minister, and we are not necessarily proposing that we start from scratch. 
we could enter into negotiations so that we become integrated in our planning so that we leverage on the already existing infrastructure developed by higher education. As universities are connected from KZN to Gauteng, there are thousands of schools that are within the 10 kilometer radius of this backbone, but uh, as though we don't belong to the same government, that broadband connectivity just goes zoom past the school to the next university. So we need to work in an integrated way. Um, the second question was around um, the, the finalization of the e-education strategy and uh, that uh, we're reporting that uh, that strategy uh, is under review and that it will be uh, finalized very soon. An approval of the digital guidelines or the digital guidelines to guide all stakeholders towards providing a 21st century learning, teaching and administration. Um, we just received a presentation now in plenary um, and, and uh, there, there was the use of waste digital um, standards, but we, 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 we recommend that let them be referred to as digital guidelines rather than standards. We, we know once there are standards, uh, then the minister is compelled to, to, to implement with or without resources. Um, the, there was also a recommendation that we need to review the White Paper 7 on e-education, which was developed way back in 2004, and that uh, it is not uh, keeping up to the developments of ICTs, uh, which are in a world of their own. That 2004, we could not envisage things that are happening now, including AI and uh, augmented reality, real uh, uh, cloud computing and, and, and all those issues. Um, we also recommend that we need to offer specific um, courses when it comes to the second area of ICT training and professional development, that we need to offer subject-specific courses to equip our teachers with specialized skills for integrating ICT into their teaching practices, and that we need to promote and support ICT champions within schools who will be our teachers, who will support uh, the slow uptakers of, uh, of ICTs, there are those who are the early adopters, as we have heard in the presentations during plenaries, and that uh, those who are not early adopters are also assisted to take advantage of ICTs. And that we also need to develop MOOC platforms, massive open online courses, and deliver small courses to build the competencies of teachers in the use of ICTs. And we also said we need to conduct baseline assessment to determine the current ICT competency levels among our teachers so that our future plans are informed uh, by this. When it comes to curriculum integration, um, we said we need to enhance digital professional development opportunities for our teachers, for them to be able to use all that is available, both infrastructure and content, uh, to plan their lessons and deliver them uh, within the 21st century environment, identify and train both teachers and learners on the utilization of appropriate platforms for teaching learning and teacher, um, uh, div for teacher development uh, 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 purposes. Um, we need to embrace remote and digital offerings, intensify continuous teacher development support, policy implementation around our teacher professional development and assist schools to utilize the digital guidelines to promote ICT integration by uh, teachers. The third area was around curriculum integration. We are proposing that we need to make curriculum content available in all formats, in all languages, for all subjects and for all grades, and that we need to develop and implement a robust advocacy and communication strategy to make our teachers and learners aware about these available platforms. Uh, so that they may use it and the content that is available for them uh, to use. Remember some of these platforms, teachers will not just use the content that is there, but teachers will be able uh, to create their own content in line with the teacher agency um, uh, uh, movement. Um, we also need to promote the digital standards in, in, implementing the digital, in implementing the digital standards, voices of parents, voices of teachers, and voices of learners and all other stakeholders should be sought 
so that this serves the purpose of education. Uh, the, the fourth area was around content development and quality assurance. Uh, we need to prioritize the completion of the e-catalog so that our schools should, uh, can be able to procure uh, the resources that can be accessed um, uh, on, 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 on our approved national catalog and that they don't use the scarce resources for uh, unapproved um, uh, uh, content. And that uh, we need to curate open education resources and make them aligned to the curriculum. They are very important. They are free of charge and that teachers and schools don't have to pay to use these resources that have been developed by their colleagues here at home and elsewhere in the world and for them to customize them to their own classrooms and DB to make content available in all formats as I indicated and that we need to prioritize the versioning of digital educational resources to cater um, for diverse needs and uh, preferences of all, all our learners. Uh, the last but one area was around monitoring and evaluation where we said with uh, digitization of the current reporting tools uh, is very important that a lot of our tools are still on paper and that we need to take a robust approach of digitizing them so that they can be used on digital platforms and in digital format and that we need to develop standardized reporting tools for both administration as well as curriculum delivery and harness existing platforms such as the modernized SASMs uh, to generate comprehensive reports and analytics that can inform decision making by both uh, uh, administrators as well as teachers inside of the classrooms in terms of supporting uh, their learners as they provide differentiated support to learners, technology assisting them to identify learner needs. We also need to foster collaboration with partners. We must foster collaboration with districts and schools involved in ICT initiatives to create our digital schools, uh, schools that exist in a digital era, and to develop and implement online monitoring and reporting mechanisms at all levels of the systems with all security features built into these platforms. And uh, on cybersecurity and digital literacy, we need to conduct a comprehensive review of the current cybersecurity framework as well as update our e-safety guidelines to mitigate the dangers that our learners face with the exposure to the internet and sites that are very dangerous um, to, to learners and uh, as well as teachers who need to be assisted not to get into platforms that they are not supposed to get into. So we need to update our guidelines so that we support them. Also to advocate for the strengthening uh, of legal frameworks such as the POPIA and ECA to address cybersecurity concerns, including measures to protect both uh, students and teachers. And we need to leverage on technology to monitor and control students' utilization of uh, the digital devices. And I would, I would also like to add teacher utilization of the devices. We need to recognize the critical role of parents uh, in shaping students' digital habits and attitude and the role of our partners, both NGOs, uh, unions, as well as business. Um, the aspect of community engagement and stakeholder collaboration, we need to advocate effect effectively for the use of DBE and partners platforms and undertake a comprehensive revamp of the Tutong Education Portal which has not kept up to date with the advancements, the rapid advancements of technology. It is a very good platform with very good resources, but uh, our teachers are not accessing it because it is lagging behind. We need to establish robust monitoring and evaluation mechanisms to assess 
the effectiveness and impact of partnerships and collaborations with the private sector as well as NGOs and promote synergy uh, with all role players to ensure effective coordination and alignment of efforts uh, related to ICT utilization. Um, we also need to have a feedback mechanism uh, that would assist us to have and put in place continuous improvement of our systems and mechanisms. And we said we need to promote utilization of all available platforms, such as WhatsApp, uh, bulk SMSing, um, uh, to, to obtain parents, teachers, and learners' views on effectiveness of current and future ICT utilization in our schools. And uh, the modernization of SSMs as well should make provision for creation of dedicated parent, teacher, and learner management systems, PMS, LMS, and TMS, uh, with a view of obtaining their views with a centralized login point. And once they log in, then the system can direct them to their own management system to, to express their views. We need to foster interdepartmental integrated planning. I made reference to DHEAD earlier on, and that we need to do this with other government departments, uh, like Department of Communication and uh, Digital Technologies. Chairperson, thank you. I saved you four minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tabane. Uh, note your questions and your comments. And if you look at the recommendations in the three from the three commissions, uh, they are short-term, mid-term, and long-term. There are things that can be done uh, as soon as we leave the village meeting, and there are things which can be done in two months, there are things which can be done in a year, and then we come back in the next Lekhuta to give a report back. The next uh, presentation or report will be done by Mr. Mrs. M. Pile. Uh, it's about care and support for teaching and learning. Yes, thank you. Minister, Deputy Minister, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, good morning to all of you. Um, so the commission that we are looking at is care and support for teaching and learning. To place into context, um, care and support for teaching and learning, as you know, is the 2008 SADAC Minister's commitment. Uh, some of the activities that the care and support framework speaks to is the creation of a socially inclusive and cohesive school environment, the rights of the child, which goes beyond education, and equality being key, and it addresses the social inclusion and barriers that hinder participation. Some of the success factors are framed by age-appropriate enrollment, school attendance and completion, and providing the opportunity and support for learners to reach their full potential. Care and support is important. It is us being intentional in what we do and how we do it with the child at the center. Oh, sorry, because I'm struggling to see. I need my glasses. Okay, so I think everybody's familiar with this, reinforcing the fact that the child is at the center. The CSTL pillars, as you know, there are 12, 12 of them, and this is really what um, uh, um, framed our work. So in terms of the 2023 Lokotla recommendations, we thought it was important to reflect on it. Um, I think yesterday when uh, Dr. Koza spoke about the CSTL investment portfolio, he asked the question, why is it difficult for investors to support um, CSTL, and we found that 
2023 recommendations were fairly substantive and that there were tangible structural um, developments that it was important to note. So the first one is the revision of the CSTL conceptual framework. The framework needed to be revised in order to be responsive both to um, needs within the environment, but also the National Development Plan and the National Strategic Plan for Femicide and Gender-Based Violence. With support received from UNICEF, the framework has been revised and is in the process of being finalized. Um, the child, sorry, I'm struggling to see now. Um, the Child and Youth Agency Framework we looked at the training of uh, master trainers, um, and 110 were trained. The training of um, the RCLs within the Ubuntu Leaders Program, 2,777 were trained, and we hosted an inaugural RCL conference in 2023, which was attended by roughly 236 RCL members across all provinces. Um, the strengthening of the school safety work. Um, all school safety programs, as you know, are directed through the National School Safety Framework. At a province, um, district and school safety committees were trained on the NSF, uh, the NSSF, and almost 180,000 have been trained to date. There is an interdepartmental campaign on the prevention of violence and social ills. And in collaboration with SAPS, there were 3,263 3, searches and seizures between 2022 and, oh, that's so much better. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and in scale up of CSE, um, CSE strengthening continues and we've been able to expand it, particularly into the Northern Cape through the support of the G2G and the Global Fund. And we're happy to say that CSE is being scaled up and saturated in all nine provinces. And then a very important development is the establishment of the CSTL UNESCO chair. Um, the chair has now been approved and we have Professor Jace Pillay from UJ and uh, Professor Rebulishle Molitsane from UKZN who serve as chair and deputy chair. And it's a significant development because it allows us to develop a research agenda for CSTL. So in terms of framing the two presentations, I just want to quickly play you a little bit. Okay, so that was a very quick one. I hope you saw it, but I think it really articulates the dimensions of violence that we're looking at. And what the commission did was to lift two pillars um, that it focused on. One was education for sustainable development, uh, which looked at um, responding to the fact that South Africa is feeling the impact of climate change, heat, drought, food insecurity, water scarcity. And basically, we looked at what changes do we need to make to ensure that we have resilient schools that are ready for this kind of future. In terms of violence prevention, we know that the climate of institutionalized violence in South Africa is, is extensive. How do we begin to shift the culture of bullying, corporal punishment, and gender-based violence when it is so ingrained? So what works and what doesn't work? We had two very interesting presentations. The first on violence was by Professor Naubisa Shai. She basically spoke to us um, around violence and violence prevention as it relates to educators, learners, and parents framed within a gender and power framework. She spoke to us in terms of what do we know, and we know that violence against children has a deep and enduring impact. She shared fairly stark statistics in terms of children and adolescents with clear links to gender and power. She spoke to us about the drivers of violence, both structural and relational. She emphasized the patriarchy, early exposure to abuse and trauma, poverty, inequality, alcohol and drug abuse, and she made the point that violence breeds violence. We agreed that schools were a microcosm of communities and society, 
and that there was a need to address community-wide ills to prevent them from coming into the schools. We spoke about prevention levers, and she made the point of cross-cutting uh, and lifespan, uh, lifespan interventions where we looked at age-appropriate programming, we looked at the notion of empowering women, preventing the use of violence, reducing structural inequalities, and changing gender norms with child protection being at the center. She went on to share with us some evidence-based interventions, and we looked at a 10-lever uh, program design template, and she she was able to show that some of these interventions do have successes to reduce violence, both intimate partner violence and peer violence. She spoke quite a bit about the right to play and the notion of how arts and sports can be used to uh, proactively address violence. She emphasized multi-sectoral collaboration and she spoke to the notion of classroom management and positive discipline as an alternative to corporal punishment needed for educators. This gives you a sense of the uh, 10 levers. As you can see, it talks about embedding interventions in research. She spoke about the fact that we have multiple drivers of violence. Um, she spoke about patriarchy. She spoke about the notions of um, gender and social empowerment. Um, group-based participatory learning for adults and children, the notion of em uh, uh, um, emphasizing empowerment and age-appropriate design for children, um, that we needed to, to look at um, carefully designed and user-friendly manuals and support, particularly with regards to teachers and how then do we integrate support for, us, um, for survivors of violence. Um, and she spoke about the need for the intensity and duration of interventions and that staff and volunteers are selected for their gender equitable attitudes and nonviolent behavior. So who facilitates and how we facilitate are being are, are noted as very important. We then went on to education and sustainability development in South Africa. Um, the presentation was done by Ms. Shanu Missa from the South African Biodiversity uh, Institute. She spoke to us about the Fundisa for Change program, um, where teacher education was key, and that educators needed to develop knowledge, skills, and agency to address social, ecological challenges. She made the point that for citizens to thrive, we needed healthy environments. She spoke to us about the fact that human well-being, human health and well-being correlates with environmental health and well-being and that it enables one to facilitate <coughs> resilient human beings. She shared with us a whole school approach and a curriculum activated change. She said that ESD had the potential to transform learning environments. She did make a note that educators and school management teams find it challenging to connect to the concepts and teach. She made the point that it's, it's concepts that are large and that there was a need for us to demystify the concepts. Um, and the use of indigenous knowledge came up as a critical uh, lever and that we needed to look at um, community concepts to help us understand um, elements around um, um, sustainable development. So colleagues, what was interesting was that when we started distilling the recommendations, it made two very important points. The one point is that it showed us the connectivity of the pillars of CSTL and how important it was. In fact, when we distilled the recommendations, we found that the recommendations spoke to both the topical and thematic areas, and that's how we framed the recommendations. The first one was, which again was very interesting that it's a theme that's running in all the commissions, is the revolutionizing of teacher training and development. Colleagues also picked up the pipeline issues between higher and basic education and the need to be intentional in advocating for content inclusion and teacher education training. We argued that systemic change is needed to look at how CSTL may be featured. 
Some of the activities that the team committed to was to link to teacher training institutions and map where care and support is placed and how it is leveraged to leverage such opportunities that currently exist, such as teaching for all, connect with respect. I think colleagues have also made the point of establishing a, a defined link with the Department of Higher Education and Training, and in particular, the Education Deans Forum. And we made the point of appreciation to UKZN and the fact that they have a compulsory module for all first-year students that focuses on xenophobia, gender-based violence, homophobia, and race. There are probably other institutions that are doing such work. The second recommendation was the notion of multisectoral collaboration and partnerships. We recognize that CSTL in its width and breadth in terms of the 12 pillars is not the sole mandate of the Department of Basic Education, that we do play a coordinating role, but we made the point that partnerships needed to be deliberate and intentional, and CSTL actually then allows for the expression of multisectoral partnerships. The activities here was the convening of the CSTL steering committee that brought together academic, civil society, government, and UN agencies, um, there, there is a leveraging of support and resources to drive the agenda, and activities included advocacy jamborees in the CSTL space, which is a tangible expression of the intersectoral partnerships. The uh, third recommendation is on curriculum, our age-old gripe that the LO notional hours needs to be increased. I think we need to now be intentional about it, um, we know that um, life orientation is a whole subject for a lot of the CSTL ESD issues. We know that ESD is present in a lot of the learning areas, but it needs to be more deliberate in terms of delivery, so the how is missing. Um, and the activity is to look at developing a structured framework and content for ESD. I think. Dr. Watson indicated that there is a draft framework on the table. One of the key activities that uh, came up was the fact that we needed to utilize the co-curricular space, but perhaps in a more deliberate programmatic way. The last recommendation spoke to uh, early childhood development. Um, and I think the theme again, talking around uh, values education came up as a very strong um, uh, recommendation in our group um, and the notion that it needs to be entrenched into the lifestyles of children within the ECD space to institutionalize concepts that look at violence prevention, um, ESD, and the notion that culture is uh, dynamic and evolving and if we are responsive to that, we can also ensure that behavior um, you know, is changed. And one of the, the, the sterling examples in the Department of Basic, Edu uh, Basic Education is the hand wash program, which is done in grade um, R and 1, and you are seeing children um, practice those skills almost as a norm, and even you know, translate those skills when it comes to their parents. In terms of the activities, we recognize that uh, ECD is a new and emerging area for us, but it presents itself as an opportunity to leverage, and the, the team will spend a lot of time doing lobbying and advocacy to look at content integration within that area. And that's it from us. Thank you so much. There's no announcement or no advert, but perhaps... <laughs> What we do want to say to um, DG, that the team agreed that actually CSTL and CAN support is not a soft issue. It's actually equally a hard issue. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. I agree with you. It's no longer a soft issue. We are facing so much uh, of challenges regarding CAN support that... Uh, really it qualifies to be categorized as a hard issue. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. The next uh, presentation will be on early childhood development, will be done by N. Kiliza.
Good morning, Minister. Good morning, Deputy Minister. All of protocols observed. My name is Ruth Lucas. I am the Director for Early Childhood Development. I'm standing in for um, my colleague from the Eastern Cape who could not make it. I want to start out and say that our commission was very robust. Lots of challenges within the early childhood development space. However, it also spoke to quite a lot of opportunities. And the presentation that were, give, that were given to us, the three presentations, actually focused on the way forward. We know what we have because we are very grateful in early childhood development that there has been such a lot of work and now that it has been brought onto the table by nothing, nobody else but our president and our minister, that every child's life in South Africa is sacred. Our NDP goals not only speaks to the value of our children, but it also speaks to quality, implementation and collaboration. So as you see, in our introduction, we are very, very, very um, assured that early childhood development, now that the shift has taken place, has actually moved in the right direction. It is important for us to see that we develop an ECD sector with our social partners, within government, and within the ECD sector as a whole, so that no child will be left behind. The purpose of this commission, there were three deliberate challenges given to us to speak about improving coordination and collaboration, increasing access to early, early childhood development programs and giving them quality programs to our young children. Also developing a capable workforce. In our first presentation, we spoke about the social compact, getting everybody together so that we can, as government, fulfill the mandate of early childhood development. Within our social compact issue, we have and have always been collaborating and coordinating with our civic society. ECD will never and can never be the, the social impact only of government. It has to need and it needs all stakeholders. In terms of our first presentation, we spoke about access, coordination, resources, what the workforce is needed, and what quality means. It is important that we understand that in education, all of our children need the best quality teaching and learning. The reason for this is that we also, in education, need to understand that Whilst we are coordinating, integrating, we have to see that it is contextualized, that it is something that is going to move the system, that the various offerings that we have is a mixed model um, offering. So in our social compact discussions, it is about improving and redressing the past. In the second presentation, we spoke about quality. If you really want one word to encapsulate that, it was about the infrastructure and the meeting the needs of registration, which we still need coordination with our government departments and the opportunities that is available. The capacity within early childhood development is also an important category 
through collaboration, governance and leadership, capacity building, teaching and learning, the training of practitioners and of officials, the child and the teacher and the parent coming first in the first thousand days and the collaboration between health and education. It is important also to note that in our second presentation, we talk about the collaboration between communities, but it is an ecosystem that needs to be developed. In our third presentation, it spoke to the workforce. It spoke to how, di how diverse and how unique early childhood is. We need to have a pragmatic approach to what we find. Our teachers have skills, and we need to look at developing competencies. How is this all going to take place? Within the framework of the ECD strategy and the implementation plan that has landed in, e in early childhood development, it is of importance that before we go through the recommendation that you have a background to early childhood development because we are the new kids on the block. I just want to go back to what has been done last year before we start with the recommendations for this year. You obviously know that last year was our first Lakhotla. It was instrumental in the movement towards developing a service delivery model and the ECD strategy that, was, that has landed within our provinces yesterday with a detailed implementation plan. The Children's Amendment Bill has also been finalized and it's ready for gazetting. Coordination with government departments and getting them to understand the vision of the NDP for basic education. That has also been the strength of the recommendations that came out of last year's Lakhotla. So what are we asking this year? Based on all that has been said, we are looking at the workforce development, the skills and the training that is needed for practitioners to give a quality service to all of our learners, all of our children. We must look at the human resource requirements within the basic education department, but also in the provincial education departments. And the implementation of that strategy, looking that we have the necessary manpower. It is important that training takes place to ensure that we will be able to meet the NDP goals. Community engagement and training in order for us as a ECD sector to move, we cannot do this without our partners. We cannot also do this without our parents and the child being the center of all of that. So early identification for young children becomes um, paramount where we develop strategies and pathways for them within DBE and the PDs. It's important that we recognize that early childhood development is a community responsibility. We all, ECD is everybody's business. It is important that we deliver this pro program, not only with the thinking that we are able to do this by ourselves, but with collaboration and coordination. Our third recommendation 
is about inclusion and support for children with special needs. We need to prioritize children with speech problems, children who have developmental delays within the ECD strategy that has been defined. We need to train our practitioners to be able to identify young children with disabilities because as we know, early intervention is paramount. We need to increase the number of trained practitioners. We also need to train them on how to identify those children with other barriers and how to support children instead of moving them outside of the school where they can be able to be serviced within the, t the classroom. Supporting children and supporting practitioners is very important in the workforce. We must have a clear policy that all children with disabilities must remain in the ECD program, if possible. The fifth recommendation is age-appropriate placement, which seems to be uh, something that comes out on every um, roadshow, every um, in Bezo, in our various areas. The Bella Bill will define the age group for early childhood development and the two years compulsory for grade R. A standardized curriculum and assessment for children who are going to enter grade one needs to be done. Assessment tools also needs to be developed that practitioners in Nord to Four could also use. The implementation of the daily program needs to be enforced and integrated LTSM into the ECD programs needs to be supported. In conclusion, early childhood development is not only the imperatives of the department who is tasked with the running early childhood development, it is everybody's business. Thank you. Thank you very much. The village is noting uh, the recommendations, and thank you. Uh, the next uh, report is on reading. Dr. Uh, Mohoroshwane will come and present. Um, good morning to the Minister, the Deputy Minister, the Director General, and all the villagers. I have been tasked with reporting for Commission 6, which was on language and literacy, mother tongue based um, bilingual education. The purpose of the Commission was to reflect on the current language and literacy situation and then to discuss the mother tongue based bilingual education approach as a strategy to address this. The next purpose was dispelling myths surrounding different languages, including English, Afrikaans, and African languages specifically. And then lastly, advocating for pedagogies that promote the logic of African languages for reading literacy and use as a LOLTA beyond grade three. We had several presentations prior to um, starting with the discussions. Um, this section started with a documentary um, called Sink or Swim that focused on the impact of teaching English to um, African language speaking learners and vice versa, teaching English home language speakers a science lesson in Isikosa um, and then hearing learners reflect on these difficulties and their experience of this. The second presentation focused on the language context, what are the current policies and what are the stats regarding who is learning in which language. 
The third presentation um, reflected on Fort Hare's Bachelor of Education program, which is a multilingual program that um, where teachers are taught to teach in both um, English and Afrikaans, or English and Isikosa, or Afrikaans and Isikosa. The fourth presentation was on the role of language as a gatekeeper when teaching maths and science. Then the next presentation um, was on lessons that could be learned um, from the Eastern Cape model and the experience over the past 10 years, um, how corpus planning is important, uh, focusing in particular on the development of multilingual materials. The sixth presentation was on the assessment framework that is going to be introduced for mother tongue based bilingual education, how teachers and schools should be thinking about assessment and specifically um, how MTBBE will be incorporated into the assessment regime of the country. The next presentation was on the um, rollout um, of MTBBE for grade four to six uh, in science and maths. It presented different models for the rollout. This includes composition of time, how much of which language would be taught um, or proposed for provincial um, take up. An invitation was also given to provinces to engage with the DBE in order to plan the model that best suits that province um, in rolling out. The next presentation focused on evidence um, and different models of actually implementing mother tongue based bilingual um, education. What does this look like in a classroom? What does this look like in after school spaces? And how teachers can co-produce such content with their learners? And then the last presentation was on morphological awareness um, as a new approach to teaching reading uh, for African languages. Uh, we discussed some examples and practical ways of teaching um, as well as assessing this. Then our commission had eight questions to answer. Um, this informed um, what we uh, covered and what you'll see in the um, high level recommendations and activities. Detailed responses for this have also been documented. These were about language influence in terms of teaching, um, learning and assessment, with a particular emphasis on mother tongue based education. Um, the second was the disadvantages that learners face when they're not learning in their first language. The third component was specific strategies that the DBE um, could be implementing to support mother tongue based bilingual education. And the fourth um, component was around um, factors that contribute to maintaining the current status quo. The next four questions were around STEM and language and understanding this, um, and with an emphasis on research that is necessary to um, unpack the link and the effect of not learning in your home language uh, for STEM. The sixth question was around the linguistic market um, and thinking through making African languages a marketable feature of our society. The fourth, the next question was on technology and leveraging that for LOLTA. And lastly, it was around the disjuncture between um, offering mother tongue based education um, and what higher education institutions could do. We then had some discussion as well on reflections from the Lakotla in general. The first one was around the inadequacy of mother tongue based education delivered to schools and its negative psychosocial effects on learners. Uh, we see this both in the literacy aspect of what learners can do in terms of reading, but we also see this in the erosion of learners confidence, um, which compounds over time and affects their identity. This is not limited to just African languages, but it's, it extends to English and the gap or inadequacy of the English taught to learners and how that further erodes their confidence. The third part of that was consolidating those two points and using research from international um, forums to speak about language transfer and to better communicate that learning in your home language is a positive thing for your second language, even when that language is English. We then spoke about standardizing concepts as a way of ensuring that um, linguistic competency is secured for um, aspects such as maths and science teaching. 
We spoke about practical measures um, to incorporate language use. This includes spelling bees and other community engagement activities. And finally, we spoke about ensuring that inclusive education is part of the conversation when we speak about language. Then on to our recommendations. Um, the first four recommendations are about, firstly, demystifying the value of African languages. The high-level activity there is educating stakeholders um, on the importance and value of African languages. This includes ad advocacy efforts. The second is examining a language that developed here on this, in this country, this is Afrikaans, um, taking the best practices from the development of Afrikaans, documenting this and applying those lessons into African language development. The third is around um, language activism and creating a healthy and robust activism movement at all levels. And the last one is around establishing language units at provincial levels, um, mandating this and hiring languaging specialists. This is beyond being African language specialists, but people who know how to use languages for learning and teaching in education. Then the last slide was around um, using language for high status functions. Um, this is encouraging government leadership to use African languages even at official um, occasions and events. We saw a great demonstration of this with our president who in his SONA used multiple languages. Uh, we think there's space to formalize this kind of rotation by language group. Um, and another example of this was at the Pensalb, uh, well, Pensalb and DBE collaboration um, on the 21st of February, where the mother tongue-based bilingual education program was launched. Multiple languages were used um, at this high-status event. The second one on this slide is around increasing the cultural capital for African languages in the market. It's about incorporating and valuing African languages in ways that are commercialized and that lead to financial returns for African languages. The next one was around mass communication on the linguistics of literacy development. This is, a, this is on informing the broader society about the importance and the distinction of teaching reading for meaning in African languages with an African um, logic. And so the, this is highlighting the linguistic differences and why they matter. And then the last two are around rolling out mother tongue-based bilingual education. Firstly, in the schooling context, so encouraging provinces to adopt mother tongue-based bilingual education for mathematics and science um, from next year uh, for grade four to six, and then extending that beyond that. And then finally, um, encouraging and working with universities to offer qualifications in African languages, not just for the purposes of being in an African language department or for education, but being able to offer other specializations like medicine, economics, etc., all offered in African languages. Uh, we don't have a plug either from our commission, but we have launched mother tongue-based bilingual education as something that we want to do in maths and science from 2024. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was the last uh, commission. Uh, the reports are clear. They are good and they were able to keep time and the work of the commissions uh, seem to, to have been uh, very, very good. Uh, the afternoon yesterday was used profitably. Can we clap hands in appreciation of good work done? <laughs> this is how we are going to deal with the questions and comments. Uh, we'll start with Commission 1, uh, which was about the transition from school to work. Uh, developing and implementing modernized assessment strategies for the 21st century, which was done by Dr. Mohale. Are there any inputs, questions, or comments? Who is helping us? Let's start from this side. 
Do we have any question or comment that side? Then in the middle, Yes, sir. Can I start? Yes, you can start. No, thank you for the uh, feedback. I just can, can I help first to say no preamble, just go straight to the question. No preamble, yeah. go straight to the comment. All of us, uh, you can continue, sir. Yeah, I just want to just indicate that in the, I was in that commission and I'm not very comfortable with uh, some of the things that have been left out in the report back. You can give those additions. Okay, thank you. I think the, the, the first point that I want to make is that uh, we did indicate that we in the midst of uh, starting to strengthen the curriculum and there's a process has started and uh, there would be writing teams, etc., involved in the next couple of months. <clears throat> and in the context of that, I think there's a great opportunity for us to look at reviewing some of the assessment practices. Uh, some of the recommendations that we thought about was to look at, you know, infusing some modern assessment techniques to enable us to be able to ensure that the competency framework is actually visible in the assessment. Now, we are fully aware that many of these competencies cannot be easily examined in an exam condition. So we need to find different ways of presenting uh, the opportunities for learners to show the evidence of the, for example, values, other skill sets like collaboration, etc. So there were some suggestions made that firstly, we need to look at how do we strengthen the SBA in the immediate term, because there are some long-term and even immediate recommendations made. I just want to give a low-hanging fruit, for example. We could actually, as part of the SBA, include an approach like case studies in all subjects, where you could actually then start to infuse problem-based learning, phenomenal-based learning, and uh, problem-based learning in the context that, or project-based learning, so that we would be able to look at how learners in the context of a case study would be able to show evidence of all of these competencies. The other issue, I think from a long-term perspective, we indicated that we need to look at uh, a revision of the weighting of the SBAs versus the exams because the exams is high stake. And we also made some recommendations around the issue of the looking at uh, redefining, for example, the, the actual metric exams. Is it that the only qualification that we have, that's a three-year qualification, the learner sits to write the exams in one sitting? So we need to look at a long-term approach of how do we change that. We may want to look at the possibility of bringing in a modular-based program where you could accumulate, accumulate modules over a period of time so that you can eventually get the qualification. So that's some thinking that needs to come in. I think in the context of the infusion of the curriculum, uh, the competency framework, we must look in the long term to, re to look at some critical issues. For example, the issue of redefining the learning space. Because I think we structurally designed as a system to prevent us from actually making that competency framework alive. Because if you're going to still stick to a classroom like we have now and not change the pedagogical approaches, etc., the chances are that we'll still have teaching and learning taking place the same way. So redefining the learning spaces, looking at designing a school for the future, which to some extent may be totally different from the ones that we're designing and building now. And I think the last point I want to make is that I think for, we need to really uh, infuse in the system uh, issues like self-directed learning or self-regulated learning where lots of these uh, competencies that we want to see evidence of can actually start to manifest itself in the learner itself. Thank you. Thank you, Don, but you were in the commission, am I correct? Yeah, I think uh, the rule of reporting in commissions is that uh, for for the coming commissions, if you were in the commission, really, uh, we want to give uh, space to people who are not in the commission, but may I suggest that you take those omissions uh, to the commission so that the commission will add them if they are omissions. 
any hand from this side? One, you are one, you are number two, you are number three. One, two, three. Let's start. No preamble, straight to the question. Chair, thank you. My name is Reni Somnath from Satu. Um, uh, let's appreciate the presentation, one. Uh, two, um, there's a barrage of information that teachers need to know. So from each commission, from each little sector, we need to understand what information teachers must understand so they can execute. And there's a lot uh, that's coming. And we keep producing, for example, the uh, framework, standards, uh, curriculum guidelines, and we heard in the conversation that curriculum can do this, frameworks can do that. These are not living things. They can't do anything. We can produce them, but it is people that do things in the classroom. So when I talk about information, for example, the unions come up with a solution to say assessment for learning is a solution to many of the problems, and it has far-reaching uh, reach in terms of solving many problems. So my question is, how do we bridge the gap between all these dead documents that we're producing to make them into information that teachers can remember and execute and to deal with that difficult task? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Commission one is noting. Next one. Uh, I'm Alexandra Trindle-Smith from Siavula. And I just wanted to note, there was brief mention on one of the slides about an ICT integration with an uh, assessment, but what I'm curious to know is what sort of detail the, the, it will be delved into. Uh, we know that uh, education ed tech platforms can support assessment, but without official um, backing, it creates a m more burden for teachers than, than benefit. So I just am curious to know how much detail the e-assessment um, investigation is going to go into. Thank you. Next one. No preamble. Straight to the question. Uh, good morning. I'm Mirim Wekezi from Autism South Africa. Um, to commission number one about assessment and transition of learners, I feel that these assessment frameworks are biased to learners who are neurotypical. Learners with special needs are left out. That is why there is so much struggle of learners with special needs to transition from school to the workplace uh, because our assessment are very biased to certificates and our learners from special needs schools don't have those certificates and they are not even assessed. I, I think I thought, I, I heard um, a lot of talk about competency and all that. And uh, from where I stand, competency is not only about reading and writing. We do have learners who can actually show that they are competent on doing something uh, if they are assessed orally. Thank you. Thank you. Have we taken all the hands this side? You're the last one. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, my question goes to uh, Commission One. I don't think it's a question, it's just something I think it's a big omission. Um, with the, the artificial intelligence issues and diploma meals, I feel the commission should have addressed issues of cheating in exams and how that is going to be handled and how artificial intelligence tools can be appropriately used to enhance assessments and teaching and learning. Thank you. Thank you. Commission one, please prepare your responses whilst we're going to the other commissions. We take commission two, uh, which was uh, the need for proper recruitment, induction, 
and in-service professional development for improving learning outcomes. We would take questions and additions from everyone except those who were in the commission. We start from this side. There is a question. Yeah, there's one person. There's a spectrum from pedagogy to what is called hetagogy. Now, I think in pre-service training, a lot of emphasis is given to pedagogy, which is leading children. Now, the, the word in between is andragogy. And um, I've never, never in any um, gathering like this have heard that people use the word andragogy because our trainers train the adults like their children. They, they, if they know a little bit about andragogy, they get stuck with at Noel's theories, which actually in the end didn't have a lot of impact. But after that, there is a lot that was done on a pedag andragogy, and um, nobody has taken note of that. So I think the training of our teachers, especially maybe by provincial officials, um, it is not up to the standard of um, using andragogy. Now, yetagogy is self-directed learning, which started with Sugata Mitra with his hole-in-the-wall experiment. If you don't know about Sugata Mitra, Go and look at the videos on TEDx. It's, it's very fascinating. So um, I think that continuum is not happening. I think some people did hear andragogy, but I think this term, yetagogy, is probably new to most people. Thank you. In the middle, any questions? There's nothing. This side. There is only one question there, and I hope uh, Commission 2 is noting the first question, and there comes the second question. Thank you, Program Director. Yeah, my name is Fortin Kumalo from Pumalana Department of Education. Uh, there was a mention in one of the slides, uh, a statement which was saying ICT must listen to the voices of teachers. I think uh, Commission 3 also said something similar to that. So uh, I stand to be convinced whether it must end there because I think it must work both both ways, because I don't think ICT is only meant for teachers. I think we must also listen to the voice of ICT. Perhaps a clarification on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think I saw a hand somewhere there. Has it been withdrawn? No. no. Okay, let's take that hand. Thank you so much, um, Comrade Chair of the session. Um, my name is Nkanyezi Tabete from the Congress of South African Students. And um, my question to Commission 2 is that because it discusses the need for proper recruitment, how are we then making the profession um, attractive? Because I think that if we need proper recruitment, we should then strengthen ways of how people view the profession uh, overall. And that would then speak to ICT and other, um, and other aspects that should then be roped in, into teaching. And also, we have a shift or a divide in the age groups or the gaps of our teachers. We have younger teachers that are then coming into the profession who know how uh, or how much technological pedagogies are important. And then we have our older teachers who don't really have um, an, an interest or a gist to then adjust to the pedagogies that, are, that we are expected to um, to adapt to. 
So my question to the commission is that how are we bridging the gap between younger teachers and older teachers into a technological world? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commission two, prepare for the responses. Whilst we go to Commission three, the principle of one villager, one question applies. Uh, we go to question, Commission three, uh, where we were dealing with the issue of e-education transformation through the use of ICTs post-COVID-19. Uh, do we have any questions from this side? Uh, this is Commission 3. Do you have a question for the Commission 3 now? Okay, let's start with you. One villager, one question. Uh, thank you again. Um, so on this commission, my question is that, uh, actually let me make a statement before the question. Um, after uh, COVID-19, right, because we were forced to then use technology in education uh, during COVID-19, but we are seeing a significant, um, a significant decline in use of technology in the space so now that we are moving away from COVID-19. So from um, an official's perspective, how, they, how, they, how are they making sure that implementation of, uh, of, of technology after COVID-19 is we are, going, we are going for it, we are running with it, and that we are not uh, going back to the traditional ways of teaching because that's what we are seeing now, that, okay, now because we are not at home, people are not coughing and, and doing what, what, we are now going back to uh, the traditional ways of, of, of teaching. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Is there any other question this side? There is a question. Uh, no, thanks, thanks very much, Chairperson of the session. Uh, standing here yeah. is Carlo Machadisa, the national caretaker of COSAS. Uh, Chair, one will first acknowledge that indeed what the latter speaker would have indicated it is true. Post-COVID-19, a lot would have changed in terms of the technological way of, 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 of being taught in classroom. But I want to, I want to chair, uh, uh, submit one thing to say maybe, maybe as the other speaker on, when commenting on Commission 1 would have indicated, maybe the problem is on on, on, on pedagogy. I believe that if we were to get deeper into thinking that the banking theory that is being used in the uh, 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 pre, pre pre tertiary level, it is it is it is a, 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 a kind of pedagogy that is the pedagogy of the oppressor. If we were to look deeper. If we were to look deeper and try to practice what we call critical pedagogy, as defined by Paul Ferrer, who was quoted on the first day of opening by Comrade Matomi Shilwan, when he says that a, a critical pedagogy is the pedagogy of the oppressed. Now, if, 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 if critical pedagogy is to be put in place, uh, as, as, as it will embody our perspective towards changing education, pursued, of course, with our COSAS message, which is each one teach one. On critical pedagogy, we will believe that a learner will be a teacher and a teacher will be a learner in the, in the, in the, in the same space. So both will teach and learn through dialogue. So that is what maybe will bring us back into the ICTs post-COVID-19. Because it is only when we look deeper into how the curriculum content is being delivered to learners that we can now speak about the digital way or the technological way of delivering this content. Thanks. Thank you very much. In the middle. I don't see any question. This side. Please provide the mic if you see a hand. No questions. Thank you. 
Commission 3, please uh, look at uh, the comments and questions so that by the time uh, we, uh, we come to an end, you'll be able to come to the platform and respond uh, in, I mean, briefly. We go to Commission 4, where we're talking about care and support for teaching and learning, uh, a very important uh, issue. Any question on, the, on this side? No, let's start from this side. No question in the center. There is a question at the center. Please provide the mic. Everybody is familiar with the term dyslexia, but uh, people are not familiar with the term dyscalculia. Now, with uh, dyslexia, it's people that find difficult to read and to work with, um, what you call it, not numbers. But uh, dyscalculia is people that really struggle with numbers. And um, there's not a lot of research done in South Africa about the prevalence, but a little bit shows that it's at least uh, just as prevalent as dyslexia, which means it affects 5 to 10% of our, um, let's say, community, the whole of South Africa. Now, I was wondering if we have an intervention where these children, because you know what it means, and I have it, you don't, you don't, your spatial recognition, you, you, you don't know directions. You, you can't read an analog clock. So, so there's a lot of um, things that a child with dyscalculia can't do. And they must be taught to relearn, and they can still do it. Usually, and um, I feel proud of that, they're usually very intelligent. <laughs> and um, so won't our maths marks improve? if we maybe identify these learners and give them special support. Thank you. Uh, we are done with care and support. Oh, there is one hand there. Good. I'm not sure it's still good. Okay, but it's still good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman. Yes. Um, I'm Timaga Zolugola from University of Pretoria Faculty of Law. So, um, Actually, I was actually looking at the video that was being played here by one of the speaker. I think it was Ms. Play. Yeah, so because I'm also majoring in child law and educational law, actually, I so saw a need to make a comment on this, and this also affects some of the speech or uh, things I should have been discussing on my platform uh, three days ago. So I was actually looking at this, and uh, it touched me so much because in the child of law, in the uh, Department of Child of Law, we get to look at some of the things that affect these kids. And I think it's very important to incorporate education and law all the time so when we do these things so that we know how to handle these things legally. So and um, so um, so as part of the as one of the education activists and, and award winning student at University of Pretoria. So I would like to make a comment that uh, I used to be one of the top students in my school. And actually, if you can actually look at that video, most of those kids who look naughty. They might not be top students, but because of the lack of support that they don't get, so, and most of the teachers, they only focus on top students in the class. I'm sure you can be very aware of that. So through the, through the program that I've created, uh, which is DK Lugola Global Education Institute, I've, I've been actually analyzing those things and providing mentorship. And I can tell you, uh, Chairman, that uh, most of the kids that actually are from our program, they were actually one of the South Africa's top learners, just because of, even though they were didn't get support from their teachers. But actually, the, the meaningful support, actually, that where we actually show, uh, we become visible enough to these kids, it actually helps uh, change the country. So I actually uh, suggest that uh, most of our teachers, they must try to become visible or even engage with the, uh, stakeholders. These stakeholders, we must actually, they must try to find the younger people who understand those kids. Because I think teachers, most of them, let me talk about teachers who are old. Uh, some of them, they're old and they don't understand they, 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 how innovative these kids are. I, I, can, I can also assure you that uh, some of these kids, they are troublesome. Um, again, I, I have, I, there's this artist called Shebeshit in South Africa. Actually, I have a kid, I, I, have, um, I have actually a student who was producing a song with that guy. 
That guy caught distinctions in South Africa. He caught those mass distinctions. But because of, they had someone who believed in them. And uh, I can also show you that uh, this, these kids, uh, even in tertiary, now they are actually some of the South, uh, South Africa's top students, even in, in different tertiary institutions. So I believe that uh, these kids they must actually get enough support, or they just, uh, uh, these teachers must also find a way in which they can support these kids, even though they are not top students, because they just need a, someone who believes in them so that they can reach their full potential. I, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Then, uh, colleagues, we are not doing well in terms of time. In fact, we are operating on a zero minute available, but I will suggest that we shorten our questions and uh, we also have one question per villager. There is a hand there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair. Uh, we just want to say thank you to everybody that's been participating online. We just have one uh, comment for Commission 4. It comes from Sigamani uh, Naika. It says we should draw a clear distinction between ECD, CSTL, and inclusive education. A good start is to ensure inclusive education is the broad framework. I'll repeat that. It said we should draw a clear distinction between ECD, CSTL, and inclusive education. A good start is to ensure inclusive education is the broad framework. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. There is a gentleman there who has a question. It's you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, with regards to the recommendation by um, the, the Commission uh, talking to Ken support for, for teaching and learning, uh, we noted that uh, they recommended that uh, there should be an increase in the number of hours for, for um, life orientation, Chairperson. Um, while we note that, uh, we are also noting obviously that uh, we'll uh, obviously increase the number of workload uh, for teachers. Um, well, well from, from where we sit, um, we, we do not know where, what, what informs uh, such a recommendation. In our view, there is, there is no data uh, suggesting that, uh, uh, you know, the impact of, of, of the number of hours for, for this subject um, in, impacts on, on the uh, learners' psychosocial as well as emotional uh, needs. So, so from, from where we sit, um, uh, Chairperson, without increasing the number of hours, uh, understandably so, without any uh, basis, as I said, that uh, they, they, there is no research that supports uh, such. Uh, we, we recommend uh, uh, from where we sit as, as National Teachers Union that rather let us look into the recruitment of, of uh, caregivers uh, to our schools to provide uh, psychosocial as well as, as uh, emotional support for our teachers and learners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Commission 5, Early Childhood Development. Start from this side. We'll take one question. There is one question. Oh, only two. We are dealing with two issues, the time budget as well as doing justice to the recommendations. Two hands there. Uh, you are number one and you are number two. Uh, let's start with number one. Uh, greetings, uh, uh, colleagues. And uh, thanks, uh, Program Director. Uh, my name is uh, Rex Mulefe. I am uh, the co-chair of uh, the ISF, South African ECD Integrated I mean, Intersectoral Forum, which derives its mandate directly from ECD policy of 2015 and uh, the National Development Plan. And I'm also the director of Motel Training Institute Trust, and uh, I just want to say a program uh, uh, director that uh, firstly I will start by appreciating the leadership uh, from DBE uh, that has, uh, you know, prioritized early childhood development because for many years we have been uh, struggling with a political will. Uh, in that front, we have made some strides. Um, mine is brief. I just want to make uh, some few uh, uh, requests or additions to the recommendations. The first one is that um, the second children's amendment bill ought to be finalized and gazetted because that is key to addressing many challenges that we are confronted with within the sector. 
And another thing uh, that I want to point to is appreciation, uh, Chair, of the anthropological uh, you know, evolution of early child development. Currently, the various ECT sites are receiving a, a subsidy of 17 rents, which uh, per child, uh, and then of that, they are expected to take, to cater for nutrition and some other operational uh, you know, cost, and uh, that money is quite little, and it's not even aligned to the uh, you know, inflation. So our appeal is that let uh, the subsidy for these uh, uh, practitioners, for this ECT site, be increased and uh, be aligned to uh, the inflation. And I'm arguing that let us be able, collectively DBE, to put a business case that will be presented to the National Treasury to say, this is the solid case, this is the case for ECT, because really we cannot survive on 17 rent per child. So those are the issues that uh, I wanted to uh, appreciate, and, and also the endorsement of the uh, vision, I mean the 2030 ECT strategy, because that strategy was supported collectively by the entire sector. And in conclusion, Chair, I want to appreciate the support of all the unions here, Basel, Chabu, and all of these people whom I happen to work with, who have shown interest in early childhood development. We are banking on your colleagues. Let's rally uh, uh, to, uh, to support early child development because it will be not justifiable to talk about nation building without focusing on early child development. Otherwise, that will then become a sociological fallacy because a proper sociological approach is to start on the foundation phase. Those are my submission, uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. From appreciation to questions, there are two questions. Um, morning, everybody. I'm Ria de Villiers from DBEE Cubed. Um, a lot of mothers in communities start ECD centers to survive. And I think what is omitted in the plans is development of those young mothers in an entrepreneurial mindset, in resilience, in how to run a business, because if we don't do this, and the previous speaker said, 17 rand per child is not enough. They need to start seeing this as a viable and sustainable um, project. Thank you. Thank you. There is a last. Uh, yes, Emma. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I have a recommendation. I have an observation comment, and I have a union a question and a union position. So the recommendation I think comes from uh, your introduction around the recommendations coming out of the La Hotline that we would go back and and reflect uh, next year. I want to propose. Uh, on behalf of NAPTOSA, that we actually reflect quarterly so that we can uh, establish whether it's effective or not, and, and, and that's the issue. The other reason for that is if we do not do such, some of the recommendations, people will run with it thinking that it's all and well. So that's the recommendation. My observation from the Lakotla and in participation in the commission is that there seems to be a disjuncture uh, across the directorates. Uh, and I'm speaking particularly from our involvement as labor in the digital, uh, change, uh, digital skills for the changing world teacher union DBE collaboration project. So since 2022, we've trained over 45,000 teachers in the foundation phase in primary, uh, primary school on coding and robotics and digital skills uh, with the intention that these learner teachers will transfer that knowledge to the learners. We've worked with Intel, which teaches digital skills, teaching your basic concepts um, using your computer. And um, that is being transferred in our schools as we speak. But what came across yeah, in, in, in the commission that I was, that people from different directorates and, and in PDs and national uh, were not aware of what was happening within the space. So sh surely there should be a closer synergy of what's happening in, in teacher development, curriculum, 
um, I think there's another t uh, PDO uh, directed, etc. So that's a rec um, an observation. Then the point we've heard across... One villager, one question I, or I, comment. I didn't have come to my question yet. I did say I had input. No, it can't, it can't be that, uh, ma'am. We, you we, 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 need, we need to respect the village and the villagers. No one should dominate. If we had time, we're going to give you more. Kindly All right. I'll ask the question. consider others, please. I'll ask the question. In light of the teacher's uh, role and why we need the teacher's voice. Because you need to stand in the shoes, and this is Dr. Brad Johnson I'm quoting. You need to stand in the shoes of a teacher for a month at least before you decide how how he or she should be teaching. So you need to take note of that and the point that Prof made about academic views have times have misled the system. So coming to the ECD particularly, the question is, we only focused on the, the migration, not to four years old. DBE's definition of an ECD is not to nine years old. Why have we not spoken about the mandatory um, making a grade R and R are compulsory. Why has that not been included? Why have teacher unions not been included in the ECD grouping? We have members in the private sector. They are workforce. We have a, an interest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let us go to reading, colleagues. But if you have any other issues about other commissions and other things, we will go for lunch and uh, you will be able to engage further. The, main, the reporters will be there. Let's go to reading, starting from this side. Number one, I'm, I'm kindly appealing to us, all of us colleagues, that in the interest of traveling and many other things, let us share the time that we have. Let us not have people who are dominating the platform because time is against us. That is a very humble and a respectful request. Um, Chair, um, first, just um, this is this is one of my soapboxes. My, my, my soapbox is, is not the highest one. I'm speaking on behalf of a very good friend of mine and and, and um, activist as well. In the whole teaching of mother tongue and and, and bilingualism, the, to me there was a huge gap. What about South African sign language? We did not see anything there. And when we speak about South African Sign Language, what are we doing, and please do, when we speak of mother tongue education and bilingualism, can we please include budgets for, um, for, 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 for people that speak mother tongue, uh, sign language is mother tongue, and can we normalize that and offer that perhaps in, 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 in our mainstream schools as an additional language for hearing people to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Reading from this side. Nothing from the center. Oh. Check the platform. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Yeah, my, 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 my comment is based on the recommendations, just to say I saw a gap. I, I did not see the low-hanging fruits, like maybe using different languages for signage at public places like schools. I think this could still be integrated into the recommendations which were presented. So, thank you. Thank you. I think there is a hand there at the corner. Thank you very much. Um, comrade uh, Chairperson and the House, my uh, question uh, is that if we are then integrating languages into the school space, does it not make sense that uh, when examinations from primary school up to high school must be then written in all 11 official languages because it doesn't make sense to me that we have a statistic that I don't really understand that learners in grade four cannot read for understanding. We, in which language can they not read 
to understand because they are started in their African languages. And then now, when they get to grade four, they are magically expected to then read in English for understanding. If then we are saying that we are prioritizing our African languages, let then let us be taught in our African languages in the classroom and then move it on to assessment. This would then require us in the, the, the digital um, in the digital devices that we are then going to use. Let them also um, accommodate African languages. Thank you very much. Jefferson. Thank you. Uh, this side. Any question about reading? There's no reading interest. In our schools, we teach the European languages like French and German, nearer to home, Kiswahili. Are there any, any plans about the Khoi Khoi, the Khoi San, and the Khikwa languages to preserve those languages and those children? They are minority, but um, they're part of the village. Thank you. Uh, am I leaving out any other question on reading? Seemingly none. I am now going to give uh, the presenters in commissions two minutes to respond. The reason why two minutes, it is because most of uh, the speakers uh, were actually adding to what has been said and to recommendations. But where there are questions, then those questions can be responded to. I will start with Commission 1, Doc. Oh, it's Dr. Polia. Um, good morning to Minister, uh, Deputy Minister, MECs present, and all senior officials together with colleagues. And unfortunately, uh, Dr. Mohale had to attend to another meeting. And as the chairperson, I'll attempt to respond uh, to the very important points that were raised. And uh, firstly, in response to Mr. Don Hari Pasad, I want to assure him that every point that he raised is definitely included. But the difference is that we had to, in our presentation, uh, focus at a very high level. So at the high level, uh, Mr. Hari Pasad may not have seen directly what he was expecting to see, but it is included, and uh, if he's still concerned, uh, he can certainly arrange for a consultation session with the chairperson, and we'll certainly point that out to him. Um, I think uh, Reni, uh, Dr. Somnath raised an important point, and uh, it's, it's more about frameworks do not do what is required. Frame, frameworks are merely a facilitating tool, and I think the point that he's raising relates to integration of key aspects which relate to teaching, learning, and assessment. And in order to facilitate that kind of integration, we are saying as part of our curriculum and assessment strengthening and modernization, there are five key areas that we are going to refer to as levers, which we must take as a collective in our process moving forward. And they are the curriculum, assessment, teacher development, learning and teacher support material, and very important, the learning environment. And unless these five move together in an integrated manner, the change that we're anticipating will not happen. Uh, the, the support from Siabula in terms of ICT and how we could facilitate assessment is noted, and we will certainly engage with Siabula. Inclusive education, that certainly is a priority, and it may not have come up strongly. But the point we made as a recommendation is that as part of school-based assessment, we need to look at different forms of assessment, different forms and types. And those different forms and types are the different forms and types that will also address the needs of learners 
with, with special needs. And finally, the tools that will assist us in terms of reduction of irregularities, that is part of the technology that we are engaging with on a continuous basis. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, let's take Commission 2, uh, Basil. Give Basil the mic. Thank you. Mr. Chair, there were really no questions. The first one was a point about um, the different types of pedagogies and making a distinction between pedagogy and andragogy and utragogy and, of course, whether it's for adult learning or adult directed learning, etc. But it was, a, it was a comment. It was not a question that is directed at this commission. But the point mustn't be lost that we must remember that when we plan for, for things, we have to plan it differently for, for adults than for children. And then from, um, from COSAS, the question about how are we making the, the uh, profession attractive, um, I can give you a thesis on that, but it was not in the commission. So I am limiting myself to say, there is a point, we must also remember that the, the profession must attract the best people. And if we don't have the things that attract the best people, then we will forever be complaining about that. About the shift in age um, and the, the, in terms of digital learning, everybody ages. Just look at me, yesterday I was much younger than I was today. And... Uh, and with that comes a certain gap. But I want to tell you, if you look around here, and the average age is probably much higher than it should be, and these people are all quite digitally uh, uh, schooled. That says we mustn't underestimate how much the people who are a little older know. But everybody has to climb on board. And thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commission Three colleagues. Uh, I think Basil is actually helping us here to say where there are comments, you leave it as it is. Just address the questions. Commission Three, Mr. Tabane. Is it Mr. Tabane? Chairperson, Mr. Slabani is not available. I'm, he's asked that I, on behalf of the Commission and on his behalf, respond to the questions. It's Hema. So in terms of the first question around uh, the use of technology, um, I'm reading from Mr. Shlobani's uh, response, is that um, post-COVID, the, the intention was that post-COVID, we shouldn't be going back to be 100% reliant on our old ways. However, technology research on the use of technology and the dependence during COVID did indicate that the, the teacher was the priority in the classroom and the technology was a tool that the teacher was using. So that needs to be noted. And however, in terms of what is being done, so on behalf of the DBE, I need to share with you what's being done. I did share about the teacher union collaboration in, in, in my other hat, but I'll just to reaffirm, so they are rolling out uh, digital skills, coding and robotic, and other ICT programs like uh, working on the LMS platform. Teachers and department officials have been trained. And then, um, I don't know how many of you have actually visited the DBE website. So the DBE website is a huge source of information. You have information for, both, for all, for parents, teachers, the SGB, and learners, and uh, you have the Tutong portal that also links off that, where there's direct uh, help for the learners. Then you've got your T DBE TV and pro the channel on DSTV. They've got YouTube channel. So there's a lot that's happening in the space. So that, in response to young Kan Kanisile's pro uh, question, then to the uh, input by the leader of COSAS, um, in terms of critical pedagogy, I think as part of the, the teams who are working on curriculum strengthening, 
that input will be forwarded to that working committee. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Please note that uh, the participants there were also interested in locking in the gains when we learned from the COVID-19 uh, that we don't lose those. Uh, let's go to Commission 4, uh, Pillay. Only questions, not comments and inputs, because that is for the consumption of the Chair and yes. the Commission. Yes, thank you, Chair. So the first question on dyslexia, I think, or is it dyscalculia? I, I think it's an inclusive education question, so I think we don't really have a comment on it. Um, and then the next two were comments. Um, with regards to the issue of life orientation and notional hours, I think that we need to keep in mind that it was a recommendation for curriculum, right? So I think one of the issues is that life orientation is becoming a catch-all for many of what is called the soft issues. Um, and I think there's a lot of research that's showing the value of, um, of life orientation, but on, on the same hand, because we're not doing justice with regards to time allocation of the life orientation, that's where research is showing a problem, right? Because we're not able to do sufficient justice with content because of the notional hours. Remember, it's just two hours a portion of which is allocated to physical education. So I think the, the, the recommendation was based on the fact that if life orientation within the curriculum provides a vehicle to address the soft issues, then we need to look at it. You know, and, and I think it's a recommendation for curriculum to take that into consideration. I also appreciate the comment that you made, but I think it's important to understand that it's also not mutually exclusive because a lot of the content in life orientation actually creates demand. Do you know what I mean? Because if you're, telling, you're teaching children, let's say you look at comprehensive sexuality education, you're teaching the students a lot about sexual reproductive health, for example. It's actually demand creation because what they're learning in the classroom, they want to be able to access those services outside the classroom. So the point you made about caregiving, about carers and service provision, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not mutually exclusive, and in fact, it's very codependent on each other. Right, but yeah. We can Thank talk you. More, though. Your, minutes, Thank your two minutes is gone. Uh, let's go to the next commission. Uh, the Commission on ECD. Where is the presenter? Thank you, thank you, Chairperson, and um, good afternoon, colleagues. I think there were four questions for us to note and, and um, consider. The first is on the Children's Amendment Bill, and I think we, we completely agree it was in our presentation. Uh, we recognize it's one of the most strategic ways of really implementing the 2030 strategy going forward. The bill has been finalized and it's ready for gazetting. Um, we also recognize the need for um, the increase in the subsidy. We know that funding is an enormous issue and, and on the first day in the panel discussion, that topic was discussed quite extensively and we will continuously every year submit our budget to the Treasury accordingly. And um, we also recognize one of the key recommendations in the, from the committee was, uh, from the commission was the training of ECD practitioners and training of ECD practitioners is holistic. It does include elements of um, business development, micro enterprise development as well. Um, and then finally, just to clarify that the Bella Bill will only make grade R compulsory, not pre-grade R or grade RR. Um, and the ECD strategy is focusing on the age group from birth to four and um, we are targeting the vision of universal access for those age groups. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, reading, Doc. Thanks for the questions. Uh, mostly it was questions on the um, aspect of South African Sign Language. 
Um, we agree, it was discussed yesterday as well in the commission, um, and it's included, it was included in the report back. Um, perhaps the thing to do is to make it more explicit that when we speak about mother tongue, we include um, sign language. However, we also want to um, nuance that even though deaf learners are taught sign language at school, that might not be their mother tongue. They might come from homes that speak other spoken languages, and so the bilingual model applies to them too, learning the language that the communities around them speak, that they can read on their own as well as sign language. On budgets, um, current efforts are not focused just on the sign language budget, but on the broader mother tongue-based bilingual education funding. Um, and efforts are underway to identify current funding sources within budgets um, to allocate these more efficiently and impactfully. In addition, requests are being made to Treasury for additional funds. Um, however, we also encourage donors and partners in the room uh, to consider funding this area of work um, as a priority moving forward. Um, on the gap in using um, different languages for signages, um, including in schools, we agree and we'll incorporate that. On assessment, um, we love the enthusiasm um, on assessing in home languages. Um, maybe it wasn't explicit in the report back, but that is a core aspect in the grade four to six um, component of the mother tongue based assessment framework. It's explicitly about starting to assess in home language, not just teach. Um, hence our move from LOLT to LOLTA, including assessment. Um, in addition, there are conversations with Uma Lucy about using uh, two languages for examinations at the metric level. This has been trialed by the Eastern Cape already using trial exams, um, and conversations are about doing that um, at the end of year exams. Other provinces are encouraged to copy the Eastern Cape um, prototype to try and do this across languages. On digital devices accommodating African languages, we agree. On plans to teach Khoi, San, and other languages, um, that is work that the DBE has started, and we note uh, the recommendation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the session on commissions has uh, beautifully and impactfully and gainfully taken a lot of our time, but uh, it's worth uh, doing because uh, it has strengthened the recommendations and uh, it has closed the gaps. And uh, can you give yourselves and the commissions a big round of applause? As we're moving towards closure, May I request the Deputy Minister of Basic Education in the Republic of South Africa to take us through the second session. Deputy Minister. of the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, program facilitator. Now the real program director is on the stage. <laughs> Minister, I think you are ready. Uh, guys, those who are assisting the minister, we need the minister to be ready. Good. Oh, it's Prof who must come. I'm, I'm looking at the program here. How many programs do we have? Show me your program.
Tell Prof. Agretang. Professor I. Rensbeck, Chairperson of South Africa NATCOM. He didn't finish his work. He called me when he has not finished his work. <laughs> Prof, come forward. <laughs> yeah. You continue where I stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's an unfinished business, so. Prof, may you come forward? Can we encourage him as he's coming? You'll open or the oh, Let me take my thing. Sure. Thank, Thank you. Sanibunan? Tober. Whoops. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, Minister, MECs, Members of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures, DG, and Provincial Heads of Departments, other senior department officials teachers and principals and their unions, the leadership of COSAS, school governing bodies, academics, NGOs, leaders and partners in business and industry, colleagues and friends. It's a very special privilege and a great honor to have been a part of this extraordinary, rich moment of reflection on the immense progress that we've made in the reconstruction, others will say the construction and development of a non-racial, democratic and inclusive post-apartheid education and training system. In this regard, I'm reminded, uh, Deputy Minister and Minister of 30 years ago, um, walking into the department and the DG then, uh, Professor Mangani, saying to me, Iron, uh, your first job uh, is these 19 departments of education that you toy toyed against. Your first job is to collapse them and to help us construct one national and nine provincial departments. I won't go into, Minister and Deputy Minister and colleagues, the, the political drama that that triggered. Um, I recall in particular the Gauteng province uh, and Pumalanga province, um, 15 months later, insisting on having all of their authorities delegated. And uh, we cautioned. Um, but after much debate in cabinet, the outcome was that the two provinces would receive all of their responsibilities fully delegated. I think we all know what happened to the matric results in that particular, or matric exams in that particular year. And so as I reflect on the conversations that we've been having, many of these thoughts came to mind and, and many of the colleagues who are in the room who were with us um, uh, in this journey, um, as I walk up to them, um, just these memories just flood uh, into my consciousness of a long journey. And so this momentous journey commenced in struggle and contest many centuries ago, this journey that we're continuing. And most recently, in the wake of the rise of the black consciousness movement in the 60s and 70s, the 1976 student uprising, and the Congress-led People's Education for People's Power movement of the mid-1980s and the early 90s. I remember Mr. Mocheha and uh, Ray Kiwakadi, who just left earlier, uh, helping us lead the charge um, at the time 
And so our work in the course of the last 30 years was also shaped by the visionary ambitions articulated in the many post-apartheid education policies, such as the enduring National Education Policy Investigation of 91, and many others formulated in the late 1980s and early 90s. Now, consider that our roles, your roles, are about and also far beyond the painstaking, detailed, complex, and beautiful teaching and learning craft of nurturing early childhood development and schooling at individual, center, school, circuit, district, provincial, and national level. At the center of this teaching and learning craft is enabling and connecting the progressive achievement of the individual dreams and ambitions of learners to those of their peers and families, the nation, the planet, and the universe. In this regard, technological advancement do not only force us to think in this fashion, but has created huge opportunities for individualized learning, and we should take note that our learners are weighed in relationship to their global peers. It is, therefore, about early on nurturing foundational values for life founded upon Ubuntu, as we learned in the conversation yesterday, which itself sits at the very heart of our Constitution. In this regard, the emphasis placed on the importance of learners experiencing teachers' love in early childhood development and education admirably reflects this commitment to giving life to Ubuntu. Inspired by Ubuntu, we should also show the love day in, day out to our teachers, to our principals, and to each other. The practice of our craft is also about thoughtfully, deliberately, explicitly, sometimes implicitly, connecting, catalyzing, and progressively enabling the achievement of our social, political, arts, culture, sport, scientific, intellectual, and economic ambitions. Ambitions that reside in individuals, individual learners, in families, communities, and in our nation. And so is the basic education leadership gathered here, individually, and those who are not with us, individually, and collectively, you carry immense responsibility to thoughtfully and deliberately progress and move forward each learner, each family, the nation, our continent, our planet. This is especially vital in this period of the immense stress experienced by our people who live in many fractures and often toxic neighborhoods who experience sky-high unemployment, grinding poverty, and endemic violence. Consider, for example, that far too many 30-year-olds have not been in a job since leaving school or college. And so we have to give our learners the very best of us, individually and as collectives, doing so thoughtfully, effectively, each day, each week, each month, each year, each decade. As I say so, I'm reminded by a colleague who had asked the question when she reflected on her 30 years of service. And she was asking, is my 20 or 30 years of service one year repeated 20 or 30 times? Or has it been a period of iterative action, reflection, action, reflection? And so we give our all and our very best so that our learners are able to adapt and to be responsive to these challenges and opportunities of, they find in their neighborhoods and in their nation. 
And so a critical, reflective, coherent, cohesive, and competent leadership sits at the very center, at the very core of this honorable and sacred project that sits in your hands. And this Lechotla, as those before it, has provided rich intellectual space for developing that kind of leadership. As the burden of this collective is to provide leadership every day, every week, every month, every year, every decade, on the basis of the values, the principles, and the ideals that you are building together and sharing. So allow me to, Deputy Minister, to now briefly share my reflections on the work of the last three days. We can do so considering various organizing or classification systems, from thinking through the lenses of the system by focusing on the burning platforms within planning, resourcing, and curriculum, or of the learning phases by focusing on the burning platforms within early childhood to intermediate to senior phase and to further education and training, or of the curriculum itself by focusing on the burning platforms that we have explored here, of languages of learning, teaching and assessment, of mathematics education, of curriculum innovation and modernization, of education for sustainable development, of digital transformation, including AI, of entrepreneurship education, and of teacher and learner well-being. My own preference, though, is to ask us to consider the evolution and the progression of the basic education system through the lenses of which parts, in which parts are we doing well, where the work should be consolidated, which requires refinement, which requires scaling up from pilots or case studies, which requires further exploration through pilots, which requires deep transformation, and finally, which requires a deliberate building of an educational professional core with shared identity and value system that strives for world-class excellence. And so the focus on teaching and learning that enables improvement in learn achievement it is evident from the DBE's excellent research capacity that we are making steady progress as evidence in the successive series of systemic and high-stakes assessments, including Pearls, TIMS, and the NSC. This progression must be sustained. We are able to sustain it when we know what is causing this progression? The question though is, which specific incremental actions can we take to reach the levels of learner achievement of peer middle income countries that sit in the middle or the upper percentiles of learner achievement? We have learned and do know that this will require special focus on the achievements of African and so-called colored learners. A simple step we can take is to identify, codify, share, and make public the success factors of high-performing township and the rural schools. And I must make a shout out for my uh, township there, I said by a mother well, Sotaisa um, High School, which is the number two math school in the country. And we're not talking small numbers. We're speaking big numbers of um, young people sitting, learners sitting, uh, and doing annually their national senior certificate exam. So what is it about these schools uh, that are doing so well, consistently outperforming top Model C peer schools right there at Kabecha? What is it that differentiates them? And in the rural areas, similarly, uh, those stars or superstar schools, what is it to define them? Can we share those lessons? And so in our deliberations, I've identified nine critical actions for us to improve learner achievement. First, the matter of the language of learning, teaching, and assessment. 
for 82% of our learners. It seems that informed by the mother tongue-based bilingual education pilot study, the next step would be to craft a detailed plan, including system, assessing system readiness for innovation, resourcing, public engagement, because there's going to be a massive public matter. It will require wide-scale public engagement if we're going to make that big shift, or shall I say, when that big shift happens. And so it will require a roadmap for scaling up pilots or for scaling up to full implementation. I think that is a, a debate that the experts uh, need to have. Secondly, in regard to mathematics and math literacy, two matters arise. Within mathematics, there is a clear message coming through that there should be greater focus on progressing towards teaching and learning higher order learning. Secondly, in regard to mathematics literacy and mathematics as subjects and as teaching, it seems that it is now time, given the many unintended consequences of math literacy, to undertake a detailed study of its role, its impact, its unintended consequences, and related remedial interventions, including given consideration to the modernization of math literacy itself, and the provision of clear guidelines on learner selection of math literacy versus mathematics. It is clear the marketization or commodification of math literacy has had significant unintended consequences. And as a result, far too many of our learners are locked out, as we heard, of very high value careers in professions. Thirdly, in regard to modernizing the FET curriculum. First, given the competing desires to widen curriculum coverage, which has heard it now during the conversation, that we should increase time for LO by way of example. So, given the competing desires to widen coverage and depth across these subjects within what we have as the six plus LO subject package, consideration should be given to narrowing subject curricula in order to deepen learning within priority learning areas within those subjects. It is time to be able to say no and no more. Because as we widen it, as we accommodate more and more demands for inclusion, so we lose uh, the intended um, uh, impact that we're seeking to achieve. Of course, there is also the more radical option to consider, which is to say, well, we're not going to be able to deepen, given the time available, across the learning areas within the subjects themselves, why not drop one subject? Why not drop LO? Argument that's been made is some of these things learners can learn as they go along. Why do we have to, what's the Afrikaans word that comes to mind? Why does the curriculum have to be propful with little room for reflection, little room for thinking, little room for growth for our learners? And so maybe it is time for us to think, obviously, with our partners um, in higher education, in the world of work um, and others, um, about perhaps even a more radical option, such as six subjects or five subjects plus LO. Such an approach obviously should also consider the modernization, uh, our desire to modernize and improve the transition to work. Fourthly, digital transformation for planning, learning, teaching, and assessment. It's clear from the detailed insights provided across a number of plenary sessions that we would do well to significantly scale transformation. However, this should be informed by a detailed understanding and study of the success factors of the many digital transformation projects and a detailed scaling up plan and roadmap, including again, is our system ready? What's the resourcing needs and public engagement associated with it? Fifthly, we seem to concur 
that the mainstreaming of education for sustainable development is non-negotiable, that is vital, and that it should be planned and resourced. Sixth, bearing in mind the clock's running on me, we are all at one on the planned and effective implementation of early childhood development and learning mandate, and that the creation of effective and accountable partnerships within a social compact lies at the core of successful implementation. Seventhly, we observed that teacher and learner well-being is paramount and requires focused attention. Eighth, we emphasize that teacher induction should be planned, mandatory, and evenly implemented across the country. And ninthly, we recognize that education district offices should be properly resourced and be at the core of education system building, effective communication, and learner improvement. Now, it's important to recognize that much of the policy work and the establishment of our education system was achieved through the support of many NGOs and university-based policy research units. The next steps of the education reform process should tap even deeper into these networks. And in this regard, the NECT presents an excellent opportunity to harness our national education improvement capabilities. The challenge to the NEC and the sector is to find an approach that optimizes the networking of NGOs, our teacher unions, business and industry, academics, and the international development community. And so, Minister, Deputy Minister, MECs, colleagues, as I wrap up, I do hope that these reflections are helpful and build upon, building upon previous Lakhotlas will assist in crafting a post Lakhotla program of action. These priority actions will most certainly be mapped into the dialogue program of the Minister with the NECT. And when taking these actions, I do believe we will move learner achievement significantly forward and into the middle tier of middle income countries. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I love it when you remind us where we come from. I was just invite, uh, appointed minister as HOD, so I attended a major conference of the progressive unions of the time. Then when we arrived there, they said, Pansy, HOD, Pansy, what I I've just been appointed an HOT now, but <laughs> passing HOT, no, not knowing that they were referring to House of Delegates at the time. <laughs> so I was so worried with the Hong Kong I've just been appointed now. I'm not going to be an HOT. But uh, now I'm going to call upon the minister to come and give us. Uh, closing remarks. Minister, over to you. Let's encourage her. She's coming to the stage. No, thank you very much, uh, DM. Let me also greet uh, all the members or participants and thank you very much for staying this long. I know it's been a very heavy one. Today, as we come to the end of these two and a half days of annual reflections, which I can only marvel at the sentimentation of our understanding of our education system, its successes, the trajectory we need to take, and of course, shortcomings that we need to address. And indeed, it reminds me the quotation from Madiba when he said, after climbing a great hill, you only find that there are many more hills to climb. And it's exactly what it feels as a sector. Sometimes people ask me to say, Minister, after almost 20 years in education, aren't you bored? And I said, this is just one sector where every day there's something new. And I think as the prof has reflected, that every day there's a problem to solve. So yesterday can be like today, and that's what the beauty of the sector is, but also that's what the challenges are about the sector. 
So, program directors, we started. I, I think we're all it's company age in your community center at our joint village, uh, the dramas and other things. But as we reminisce over the village role, I was to raise our children. The two and a half days were emotively kick-started by our president, who has a special place all the time for education. I always say to free state people, not even to the country, free state is here because, or wherever it is, they know that the president, even before he was president, he dedicated the resources and time for five years to make sure that they can set up a model. And that's why also Mabatu from the presidency, uh, from the president's trust was saying they, are, <coughs> they always seek to create models which can be replicated for the system. And indeed, he did that very well in the free state. So he did remind us of our, of our close to 30 years of education reform in the country, as a prof has done, which has seen many children accessing education and seeing many more of them passing the senior certificate. He did recognize and emphasize, amongst others, the need to modernize our education system through programs like three stream model, integrating technical, vocational, and occupational subjects. And like all of us agree that we have to prioritize ECD and development with a view to, to make sure that it's, there's universal access to ECD by 2030. And he reminded us of the teacher task force commitments that we've made as a country to ensure professional and qualified teacher investments to ensure sustainable development. And I can say with confidence, with the support, the, guardian, the guidance, and the counsel that we get from our teachers, I always say we are on safe ground and we're not going to go wrong as a country. And for that, I must always express my ongoing gratitude for the partnerships that we enjoy from our teachers, the organized teachers, and also from our parents' body, because they also assist us and support us in many other ways. Indeed, Prof, this multi <laughs> mother tongue-based bilingual education. I was quite happy to see young people say this is where we should go. So sometimes we really become very conservative ourselves as adults and fear things which people have already long overcome. You know, when we started off in 1994, I did some research on our perceptions of our people around uh, mother tongue teaching. And parents just felt they don't even start there. Well, from apartheid, we want our kids to be educated. And for them to be educated, they have to speak, they have to speak English. And uh, now we are to take to talking to us about African languages. But times have changed, and perceptions have changed. And people have gotten to, to get into a better understanding. So I'm not underestimating that people will be shocked. Because indeed, when I said to the president, hey, president, Bambezela say Achiga, mind you, we are going uh, this direction. We really, there are clear signs that we have to move this way. We can't avoid this any longer. And it, he said, oh, and it's, it reveals our age that we, had, we are 30 years back where English was, was wisdom. And if you, if you speak English with an accent, with an attitude, you're the, you're the cleverest. But I think... Uh, the younger generation, and perhaps the younger parents are seeing things differently, but I'm not underestimating the need that we're going to have to do lots of advocacy. And I think we should be ready for that. But he also reflected on the conducive, conducive environment that we have to build in schools. Even now we're running around with the MEC from Limpopo. Uh, he wants to do a fundraising because infrastructure has become a real albatross into the system. A big problem. Even where we're doing well, it undermines even our efforts to do better. I went to Mbiri, which is one of our best performing schools. They could only teach in a hall. 
there's no schools, uh, there, there are no classes, so they have to teach, I think that there are about 300 matriculants doing maths. They couldn't fit, so we couldn't even divide them into right sizable classes. It's the same thing that also MEC uh, KZN, when I went to Bizimani, which is one of the best performing schools in KZN, they were also teaching kids in halls. Big, big, big halls, because we don't have adequate classrooms. There's overcrowding, it's just a big problem. And we have to confront it. So, program director, <coughs> we are very grateful to the international committee also, which joined this year's Lekhoja. They have not only reminded us of our own commitments to the regional and global village, but continue to serve as a source of innovation, points of benchmarking, and platforms against which we test our own ideas, affirm our correctness, but also sometimes identify gaps so that we don't repeat some of the challenges they would have confronted. So within the context of our global citizenship, our education sector will further mainstream education for sustainable development, which is, I'm happy, is one of the sessions we started off with, to ensure that we play a role to protect the earth, and chiefly to make sure that we can deal with the adverse effects that are likely to impact on the global south. So I really did appreciate that we also had a focus in that area. So program director, our achievements of the past eight years, the ideas that the president cited and those that were proposed by global partners require a resilient and responsive education system that guarantees increased access to inclusive, lifelong, relevant learning for, for the future. So I agree with you, Prof, that we really have to strengthen our delivery system and, and models to make sure that all the things we commit ourselves are able to do and that we have aligned our, our, ourselves. It was indeed, you said prop four, a jam-packed program. Uh, so it was, with different elements into these two and a half days, particularly catering for the complexities that we deal with in education and also ensuring that different practitioners and players in this education village were covered. For that, we really want to thank all our presenters who provided very rich insight, uh, research and insight into the different areas of work. Also, something that we will not be able to do as a sector. We will not be able to do on our own as a sector. I always tell people that as a sector, you see with the MEC, we're now talking about ugly school pictures and other things. So you don't have the opportunity sometimes to reflect on the core business of the sector and do the necessary research. And it's this research that is done by universities, by experts, that really help enrich the work that we do because we find ourselves uh, running around with uh, important matters. I don't say squatter transport is not important, school feeding is not important, but we find sometimes ourselves just being hamstrung by those important auxiliary activities. Uh, before you know it, there's a crime. Before you know it, there's a child missing. Before you know it, there's not been a feeding at the school. Before you know it, uh, there's bullying. And therefore, we just don't have an opportunity as a sector to be able to reflect on the core businesses of the sector. And it's the support that we get from researchers, from academics, and for that we are very grateful and appreciative and I really want you to know that it really enriches the work that we do. So as directed by the president, I know we have to work on universalizing access to ECD. We have now adopted a strategy that we are finalizing the implementation programs. We, all need, we need all ECD hands on deck to strengthen the social compact and build a tight web, as the prof was saying, of relationships to deliver this ECD vision in our country. Rural townships, I always like DM to quote also hostels. Uh, when we were in Gauteng doing roadshows, and I was quite impressed to 
see the province focusing on hostess because in terms of local government occupational uh, rights, they can't open a centered hostel because it's meant for men. But the children running around today, they say it's a hostel, therefore they can't give us occupational certificates because it's a place dedicated for men. But I said there are human beings there and there are children. So let's find a way of catering for, for, for those children, let alone how it happened that at a hostel that there are children, but they are there. Yeah. So we also have to really work hard, and I'm glad that provinces are also focusing in areas where we have not been providing services. Your deep rural, your informal settlements, your hostels, your townships, to make sure that indeed we can spread our, our, our wings. And again, we depend on practitioners in this area for guidance. And in addition to the hands, we need more dialogue. It's a very difficult area. And the president did urge us to engage with the ECD community, including practitioners, funding partners will be hosting a breakfast quite soon, and the beneficiary communities themselves. Because those are the people who are servicing. Sometimes when I get into a fix with uh, partners in the ECD, I sometimes want to say, but, but what, what are the people say, Marimba, but, okay, me and you, are pulling around, but what are people saying? Because the services we're giving is also for those communities. So we are also engaging with communities. Prof, I went to a, a, an ECD meeting in the Free State and they were warning me, you know, this uh, ECD council to say, you can't go there without agreeing with us. The dogs will bite you. We have to fasten the dogs. And I to say, no, let me just check the size of the dogs. Let me go and see if I can manage the, my interaction. With and there were no dogs. There were human beings wanted to talk, but I was held in a holding room to say, you can't go there without agreeing with us because the dogs are going to bite you. So we also then have to make sure that we do engage. The NECT has been very helpful in helping us in the past years with the dialogues, because we do need those dialogues, so that we can manage if there are dogs, so that there's no, uh, no, one, no dog biting anybody, but we can sail along with everybody with a common understanding. It's a new terrain for us, it's a new space for us, and therefore we have to be sometimes assisted to, to navigate that space that is very important, that unfortunately the government had neglected for a very long time, and that's why sometimes it is a difficult space. And coincidentally, this morning, I did receive a letter from the presidency whereby he's establishing an ECD interministerial committee with higher education, health, social development, police, local government, finance, home affairs, uh, monitoring and evaluation with basic education uh, convening. Because, thank you. Because government is very bureaucratic. You cannot convene these ministers as another minister and tell them what to do. It's the president who has to formally appoint them to the IMC, give them the terms of reference, then that's the only way you can work. So all along we're just using uh, collegiality to say, minister, I want the following minister, local government, but now the terms of reference are clear, he's going to, she or he has to account to the president why we can't have a crash in the hostel, because in terms of local government laws, it's a demarcated area for hostels. She doesn't have to explain to me. He has to go and explain to the president what should happen. So we also had very good reflections on digital, digi, digital transformation. Was both the national and international lessons on digital transformation speak to our agenda here at home? Taking advantage of the di di digital revolution is no-brainer. And I think we should even find ways of making it difficult to work, not to use ICTs, even for others, even for communication. There are lots of things that I just feel that as a sector are very archaic and backward, so we monitor physically, uh, we monitor your school nutrition physically, whether children have eaten or not. There must be a system whether deliveries have happened. So there are things that I just say, it has to be compulsory that they have to, to be digitized for efficiency let alone even the classroom. So really, taking advantage of the digital revolution is just for me not a brainer. So we'll draw from these global lessons 
very practical lessons we learned from Uruguay, and the homegrown practical strategies from our own universities and NGOs working in this space it is going to help us a lot. Artificial intelligence is another area we need to start taking optimum advantage from the point of preparing our teachers to use these new aid solutions and our system to explore how we use it to better manage our planning and how we enhance the distribution of education resources. We also discuss on teachers, teacher preparations and support of our teachers, which is always very rewarding for me as a teacher myself, because teachers are extremely important in the sector and they carry the system. You can have the worst classroom going to teach under a tree if you're a good teacher, you, 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 you're really home and safe. You can have the best facilities with a bad teacher, then there is a major crisis. So teachers do require continued professional development and support based on an overarching understanding of the kinds of teachers we want to have for our country with a unique history and a unique vision. Important in working towards this vision is the need to, to carefully plan the transition to the envisaged teacher. Different countries with different circumstances take different paces and sequences of the transition based on various contextual and pedagogical considerations. That we disregard supporting teachers through lesson plans works against the logic of responsive to our contextual needs and the principle of flexibility. And I think that, uh, Dr. Polio did say to it. As a teacher, there's nothing wrong with somebody saying, here's a plan, look at how this person has structured this lesson. You don't have to take it if you have a better structure. But sometimes with the pressure, you do need to say, let me see what other people are doing. So there, there's no way you can prescribe to a teacher what the teacher does. You can't even monitor if a teacher is teaching or not. They go to the class, kids always tell me that this teacher always tells us about her children and her family and other things that's in teachers. So it's difficult. But there's nothing wrong with guiding each other's teachers. Because it's, that's where also your communities of practice come in. Some are tested lessons, I don't have to test it again. But sometimes you feel, I have a brilliant way of dealing with this matter, I'll skip this one. So we shouldn't discard them as if we want to take teachers' professional autonomy. It's some of those tools that we think we should really work with. Learner and teachers' welfare burning requires no further motivation. Fortunately, we've done very well in extending the social safety net for our learners. South Africa, through the school a program, no fees program, among others, is doing lots of work. We need to do more to extend psychosocial support that we, that we have now. And this prof who was asking us what is the priority in terms of values and, uh, and knowledge. And every time I talk about CSL, we had a road shows and a program that we were doing as part of CSL, speaking to young mothers. And I think it sometimes catches up with you. I think I was just being judgmental to the Sankita Setin Danam, but you are so pretty. How did you get yourself into this trouble, into this space? Now, at 14, you have a child. And then she says, hey, mama, if I knew. And that, for me, it's where values and knowledge come. Because she just said, if I knew. I would not have learned it there. So it's in this area also that we have to make our children know what are the things that will harm them, but also all the time give them support and understand. And as I'm going to, to close the DM, we, I also went to a school uh, in Springs, uh, and then typically when talking about children to abstain and other things. And then I said to them, let's interact. And then these young people, one by one, said, no, when we go to the clinic, we get judged, uh, and people report us to our parents. The other one, the clinics are not children-friendly. It struck to me that, hey, here there's a generation gap. I'm talking about abstention. People are already on step number three. <laughs> I'm still on step number one <laughs> to say they must abstain. They really want 
their services, they are already there in that space. So, <clears throat> and it's those things that we have to be sensitized to as we really look at this CAN support program to make sure that even ourselves, as a cool me out of tune and say, don't abstain to people who want uh, services already. <laughs> Then on curriculum, Chair, I'm also pleased that the Global Education Monitoring Report has found our curriculum to be aligned with global proficiency framework that really I found very encouraging and heartening. And as I say, it's also because of the guidance that we get from the house, not because of anything special that we are able to do. And as, highlight, as highlighted also by President, this mother tongue based by Lingwad, also expressed by the, by, by, by the prof, I think it's taking shape and ready for implementation, but we must not under, underestimate the necessity to plan, to advocate, to educate, and resource to make sure that it really does not put us back from where we were. Because there was also a concern to say, if we are now going to change the language of, <coughs> of teaching, we are going to undermine all the work that has happened before. And my view is that it has not helped us much. You remember Professor uh, Dr. Mbude says, we've done it all. English across the curriculum, and English, English, and it has become, it's clear, it's inaccessible. So we really want a language which, is, which already children have for us to be able to develop them cognitively. People keep on asking me to say, kids can't read for me, but my kid can read. Then I have to explain to say reading for meaning doesn't mean that joining words and, and, and really saying sentences with confidence. It means more than that. And that's the more than that that we require to reach through this mother tongue based bilingual education. So the deliberations chairman say on assessment also gave us a very good food for thought, which will continue to feed into the strengthening of our curriculum and our work. So while the strategies proposed by this Lekota primarily have to do with basic education sector. Much is envisaged, achievements will depend on our collaboration with all of you. As I said earlier, on our own, there is no way. I mean, the research, the information, the work, but also the comradeship, the comradeship, you just feel safe in numbers to say, I, this thing, we are all together. There are lots, the, the village is here to look after its kids, and everybody does accept their role. And for that, we are very grateful. As a primary responsible structure, we will further process these deliberations and proposals and fuse them in the planning as we always do after every Lakota. So I do want to encourage all of us to do what we can, as the prof has said, in the village, to take these ideas forward. And I do hope you live here with lots of lessons and a few ideas that you will focus on to support education and our children. And I am very grateful. Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, if we don't do what you are telling us, the system will not move. Colleagues, comrades, and everybody want to thank you. Now I'm going to call upon the Deputy Minister of Basic Education to give a vote of thanks. <laughs> no, the program director is calling the Deputy Minister to give a vote of thanks. Really. As I was looking around, I'm counting the tables that are empty. I said, wow, only one or two tables that are empty. And that shows a level of commitment about this work that we are here for. And as Minister indicated that as we convene to conclude uh, the significant 2024 basic education sector Lekhotla, I'm reminded also of the profound words of Amartya Sen, an eminent Indian economist and philosopher. Education is not only a tool for individual development, but also a mean for social change and transformation. 
This powerful statement captures the essence of our gathering here at the Patchwood Conference Center in Boxback. It embodies our collective belief that education transcends the realm of personal advancement, serving as a crucial force for societal evolution and progress. Want to give our heartfelt thanks, uh, to extend our thank and gratitude to the President, His Excellency, Mr. Sir Matamela Ramaphosa, for his guidance and unwavering dedication to the advancement of basic education. His support for our strategic, strategic initiative from expansion of the three-stream curriculum model to the uh, emphasis of early childhood development bears testament to a government steadfast in its commitment, not just to education, but to transformation. Want to thank all our international speakers that connected virtually. Thank you for your patience as the program was delayed, but you still managed to connect and deliver insightful presentations. I felt bad for them yesterday that uh, were sometimes two hours, uh, day before yesterday, were sometimes two hours late, but they were still consistent in sitting. We really appreciate. We also want to appreciate the support that the Honorable Minister of Higher Education, Technology and Innovation, Namibia, Dr. Ita Kanji Murangi, and our own South African Deputy Minister in the Department of Higher Education and Innovation for availing themselves to provide input uh, presentations on the artificial intelligence panel discussion. I want to thank them from the bottom of our hearts. We thank all the chairpersons and national edu uh, chairpersons of the, uh, uh, the chairperson sees when everyone else was asking a question to Sizwe. When we call him Mr. Nasa, uh, my question is directed to Sizwe. So I was looking around that boy, who's Sizwe? <laughs> because we only know Mr. Nasa, but uh, want to thank him, the chairperson of the National Education Collaboration Trust, Mr. Nasa, for his unwavering support for the education sector. He's always available, no matter what, any time, he pushes everything aside just for education. I uh, want to thank our honorable MECs. You know, when I look at that table, I said, ah, it's a table of girls. Girls are so committed. <laughs> I'm not otherwise, but that table, when I look at it, it's only girls sitting on that table. Thank you so much, girls. And let's continue to harness and nurture education in our country under the stewardship of the big girl herself. So <laughs> we are grateful for the sterling work done by all our session chairpersons, facilitators, and moderators of panel discussions, commission chairpersons, rapporteurs, discussions at the commissions. They, they were robust, insightful, engaging, and interesting and we appreciate the commitment displayed. We have seen that by the reports that we got today, that indeed it was not just a half-cooked work, it was a, an emotional work that we put all our concerted effort into. We really appreciate. Every educator, policymaker, administrator, and participants pr present, your dedication and commitment are the true catalyst of the change we aspire to achieve. Together, we are laying the groundwork for an education system that not only imparts knowledge, but also fosters critical thinkers, innovators, and leaders prepared to navigate and shape the future of our country and beyond. Our gratitude extends to our sponsors, whose generous support has been indispensable in bringing this event to fruition. We extend our sincere gratitude. I didn't want to mention them that day, but today I'm mentioning them. The National Education Collaboration Trust for their unwavering commitment 
and enhancing the educational landscape in South Africa through collaboration and innovation. Dr. Koza, thank you so much. Uh, the British Council, whose international perspective and resource resources have enriched our programs and broadened our horizon. Oxford University Press for providing high quality educational materials that support our learning objectives and academic standards. Via Africa, a valued partner in developing locally relevant curriculum and learning solutions that meet the needs of our diverse student and learner population. VVOB Education for Development for their role in promoting quality education through professional development and support for educational systems worldwide. Cambridge University Press, whose academic and educational books and resources have been instrumental in fostering a culture of learning and intellectual growth. Uh, the DBE E3 equipped entrepreneurship employability and education program for their innovative approach to integrating entrepreneurship and employability skills within our educational framework. Lastly, the education, training and development practice sector education training authority, ETDP CETA, for their dedication to advance education and training within the sector ensuring that our, education, our educators and learners are equipped with the necessary skills and knowledge for the changing world. Uh, each sponsor has played a pivotal role contributing financial resources, expertise, vision, a shared commitment to educational excellence. Through such partnership, we can provide a platform for meaningful discussion, learning, and progress in the a basic education sector. I would like to also uh, thank specifically the Minister of Basic Education. When we say NG I, I, I so I become so flattered, Minister. When people see me, I don't know, they can't differentiate. Every time I go, ha, now mom NG. <laughs> Referring to me, is it wow? When I go to a shop, now mom NG. Hey, my agent Jan, I never even corrected them. I said, I see appeal. <laughs> we are fine. <laughs> I don't know whether we look alike or what, but now I'm called a Jimutseka. And I appreciate I said, wow, I'm wearing a giant. It means now I'm, I'm a giant in my own space. So thank you so much for your visionary leadership in steering the basic education sector on the right trajectory. Uh, as I conclude, I want, let's embrace the spirit of intellectual en engagement and societal transformation uh, that uh, Amata Sen so eloquently advocated as we engage in future discussion and share insight. We must remain steadfast in our mission to cultivate curiosity, academic vigor, and eschew intellectual uh, dishonesty and laziness. We must not be part of that. We strive for an educational environment that is evidence-driven, empowering, and transformative. Thank you, one and all, for your invaluable contribution, your patience, your commitment, your sitting here. I thought this hour, when it comes, we'll be addressing empty chairs, but we are still addressing people. So it's time for, uh, I, I said when we started the meeting that, uh, uh, what do we call it? That we said we must support Ramadan. And now Ramadan, <laughs> Good Friday, <laughs> and, and Lent, they came together. It shows that the world now is coming together to be one. So. Go enjoy your Good Friday, enjoy Ramadan, enjoy Lent, and may God bless you all and have travel messes when you go back and stay blessed. This meeting, with the, all the powers vested on me by the minister, I officially declare this gathering closed. <laughs>
travel safe. <laughs> oh, there's lunch. Don't forget. No wasteful expenditure. Go eat lunch. Thank you.